You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. So there were six of us raising. My mum died when I was four. So then my dad remarried. And there was two more after that, so uh, there's eight of us in total, yeah. Yeah, probably not so much. It's probably more because I was there such a long time. And even now, since I've left as well, the Newcastle fans, they haven't won a trophy from since, I don't know, 50 or 60 years. You know, it's it's a frustrating thing because your job as a player is to win them a trophy. Because that's all they wanted. That's all they want is a trophy, you know what I mean? Beat uh, Holland, actually, yeah. I remember that. That was like a mad game, but... The atmosphere that day was probably the best at Lansdowne I've ever experienced. You know, we got a man sent, Gary Kelly got sent off with half an hour to go and we were chasing McAteer score, we had 10 men and then Van Gaal was sticking every centre forward in Holland on the pitch. Like, if I don't know that Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank was on, I think Van Hoydonk was on, Bergkamp, all these overmars, all these players. It was like, next time I looked over, the kitchen sink was coming on, like, you know, but... <laughs> like a 50-50, but maybe more 60-40 in my favour. It was a wet day, I remember, I come sliding out and I could see him coming sliding in with his two feet, like. And I was like, this is, this is not going to end well, but the most important thing I was, was getting the football, like, you know. But to be fair to Marlon, I think what happened, he knew I had the ball and he tried to pull out of it. So he pulled his, pulled his studs away, basically, to, 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 I suppose, try and protect me a little bit. But what he did do, his two knees come crashing into my ribs at full pace, like, you know, and obviously punctured my bowels, rushed to hospital and... Yeah, I woke up in a hospital in London the next day with tubes coming out my nose and every part of my body and... The next time we hear like shouting and commotion upstairs and then the gun went off like guys pelted like into the roof with a double barrel shotgun or something we're like fucking hell what's that like position a specialized position as a goalkeeper so it's not a good place to be you know so i seeked a bit of help after that game you know i went and spoke to the physio derek wright at newcastle still there actually and, and he you know on the qt because then it was seen maybe seen as a weakness back then that well he's going to see a psychologist he's going to get help you know is he all right like type thing because it was a wee bit you know, it was a wee bit, I don't know, maybe a little bit old-fashioned at the time that, you know, you, everyone should be mentally strong, everyone should. One, one time my brother, my brother's funny as well, my brother Lamy's, there's one time I flew back to uh, Donegal in a helicopter, like it was just random, some 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 guy offered me this opportunity, and he goes, fucking hell, look at him now, he left in the back of a tractor and he's fucking turned up in a fucking helicopter, like, you know, but it was just like mad how far, you know, things change and stuff. Boom, we're on. And today's <laughs> guest, we've got goalkeeping legend Shea Given. How are you, brother? All good, all good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me as well. Yeah. In your house, man, I appreciate that. No problem. I'm sitting here sweating, mate, trying to set everything <laughs> up. Did you say I thought you had a full team behind you setting <laughs> up and you just turn up and lights, camera, action? Easy work, mate. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's an uh, absolute honour. Like I say, goalkeeping legend, Irish legend, Newcastle. Over 600 appearances, over 100 appearances for Ireland. Like, phenomenal career, mm -hmm. very well known, very well respected as well. Everyone who I've spoke to in the football industry speak very highly of you. Oh, yeah, I'm, now yeah, I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure's on you. Yeah. How have you been? Yeah, good, yeah. Um, just keeping busy with family life and got a dog a couple of days ago, so it's like a new baby in the house now. But uh, yeah, just keeping busy playing a bit of golf and... Just enjoying a bit of life, really. Yeah. Enjoying retirement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was obviously retired when I was forty-one, which is what's that, four or five years ago. And then I was in the media for about a year or so, and then I was at Derby for the last three years there, and I left mm -hmm. just in the summer, just gone. So, um, what next? I don't know. So, if you need an assistant, maybe to help set up the cameras, not <laughs> a, a lights man or a sound man, I, I could be in. I'm always hiring, yeah. brother. I always go back to the start yeah. of my guess, yeah. yeah. Where you grew up, and how it all began. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had four brothers growing up, obviously three sisters as well, but, you know, we just played football in the front garden and I was probably, you've heard this story probably lots of times from, from other people, like, but it was as basic as that, sort of jumpers for goalposts and my dad used to be playing goals as well, actually, so he used to have all these trophies in, in the cabinet and I think he bought half of them, like, but he says he was mm -hmm. he was star man. Um, but we used to play for them just in many tournaments in the front garden, basically, and um, and normally I was sort of putting goal and the lads would be lashing shots at me from, from all angles and I'd be diving around doing a commentary pretending I was, I don't know, Packy Bonner or whoever mm -hmm. else it was. It was it was in flavour at the time. But yeah, I mean, just great memories growing up. I don't know if people know Donegal, but it's like the northwest of Ireland. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty much in the middle of nowhere, but at the same time, it's got a lot of beauty um, and a lot of nice people as well. I mean, it's a, it's, I think that's the biggest thing about Ireland in general is is the people are really welcome and really friendly. And if you ever get a chance to go to Donegal, you should. You know, there's 
beautiful beaches up there. I don't know if you play golf, but lovely golf courses and, and good people. Mm -hmm. yep. How many was in the family? So there were six of us raising. My mum died when I was four. So then my dad remarried. And there was two more after that, so uh, there's eight of us in total, yeah. Yeah, sorry if you're lost. I know your no. dad spoke, speaks about that quite frequently, including yourself when your mum passed it for that kind of made the family bond, because I know it was yeah. your aunties that were trying to... Yeah, house. yeah, obviously dad had six kids in on his own and probably six kids under the age of 10 or 11, you know, for for, for any man, I suppose, would be a big ask. Um, and my aunties, to be fair, they were doing it through kindness. They were saying, you know, why don't we take a couple and, you know, sort of lessen the burden for you? And, but my dad was having none of it, you know, so... He was adamant that, you know, the kids and the family would stick together and, and we're all thankful for that and grateful that he did do that, you know, because we have grown up as a tight family. Um, and for me in the job that I done, like we were very supportive because, you know, it can be fickle at times, especially being a goalkeeper, you know, if you have a bad game or make a mistake, then, you know, the, 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 the media and I suppose social media and things can be quite harsh on you and stuff, you know, but no matter how you know, well or, or bad you done, they were always there for you no matter what, you know, and that's that was brilliant to have on, on you know, on my shoulder or someone to talk to and whatever. So that was key. Yeah, that's a good thing, a good strong family bond. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what helped you go through your career? I think so. And I think kept kept me grounded as well, like, you know, because you hear of some players going away and, you know, signing for whatever Celtic or or Newcastle or whoever and, 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 and Man City or whatever, but you you hear them going away and then once they've signed to the forms it goes, Right, I've I've made it now, you know, and I think that's when the work starts is when you actually get across from Donegal, get across the water. I went to Celtic, of course, and and that's when the hard work really starts. And, you know, it's one thing getting there, but it's, it's, it's actually making a career for yourself then. Um, yeah. But the good thing my family did do is kept me grounded, never got too far carried away. My friends as well, my mates would go like, look at this big time shot now with an English accent or whatever. And who does he think he is? But <laughs> my accent never changed. So it's just winding me yeah. up, like, you know what I mean? But I think all them things helped, helped the yeah. through your career. I watched a short documentary. Your sister won't like this, but I think your dad used to cut um, the girl's yeah. hair short on. Yeah, yeah. Your sister walked into the, the shot with one of your brothers and the guy was saying, oh, that's two strapping young <laughs> young boys you've got. <laughs> yeah, Michelle. I think it was Michelle and Sinead, actually. The two, uh, two sisters, they were raging, like, and... I suppose my dad was just like cut it short and it'll be easier to fix before going to school like just, <laughs> we're all lined up to get our hair all combed in the same style you know so uh, looking back the girls weren't too happy about yeah. that you know but I suppose uh, it was tough times I suppose mm -hmm. with my dad especially you know and um but no, a great, great bond growing up with my, my brothers and sisters definitely and my dad as well because I know a lot of people in the premiership get a, like anybody any footballer that's doing well is kind of oh they've had a silver spoon and that but you mm. never had it easy you worked for a very for a, from mm. a very young age mm. out in your farm was it a yeah. farm and like a little we shop a, as well? well we had a market gardening business yeah so we used to grow the vegetables um, and then we used to sell them on the weekend so after school or even some days my dad would keep me off school to, to sort of work you know getting the vegetables ready for the weekend and what have you and then me and my brothers would go around the shops on a, on a, sorry, around the houses on a Friday, just literally knocking, knocking the doors and all day Saturday as well. So people look forward to the weekend and we were kind of dreading it a bit because we knew we had a hard shift they put in, you know, and that was just, it wasn't even, we didn't even get paid or nothing. It was just basically to put food on the table, you know? So, you know, people always say, you know, you said there before, but footballers, they don't know what a hard day's work is, but I, I genuinely do know what a hard day's yeah. work is, you know, because you're sort of on your hands and knees weeding vegetables all day and then, you know, you're selling them in the nighttime. But I suppose... Looking back now, you know, feel blessed and lucky to to play football for a living, you know, or had played football for a living and had the career that that I had. I remember in my bedroom wall growing up and it was, I think I had Lane Brady actually, it was you know, obviously Lane Brady's a legend in Ireland, you know, and, and just, just I think he had a Juventus top on and it was just underneath it was just the, you know, thanks thanks to football, I've seen the world or something, something something like a comment like that, you know, and I was just sort of thinking, when I'm, fin I'm finished now, I was just kind of looking back as well. I've seen so much of the world, you know, purely with a size five football, you know, it gives you so many... I don't know, so many journeys and so many different parts of the world that I would never have seen have had it not been for football, you know, and I met so many great people as well. So I've been lucky, yeah. Yeah, because you were a striker at one point in yeah. your younger age. Were you a good striker? Top goal scorer from your school. Yeah. I was top goal scorer in Columbus College, they're called in St. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah, I enjoyed it. I love, even even when I was playing professionals ago, we loved playing the odd five aside out the mm -hmm. field and stuff and, you know, bagging a goal, whatever. I was, uh, I, I just... I think there's no better feeling when you score a goal, is it? That 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 sensation. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, my dad, I think it was about fourteen or fifteen. He said you need to you need to focus on. He felt goalkeeping was my sort of pathway, and he felt that, you know, I was really good at, at, at goalkeeping. And he had this. He was a goalkeeper as well, so maybe that's where he was a bit skewed and that's mm -hmm. with his head with that. But he was kind of saying that, you know, it's a very specialized position, and you know, there's only one goalkeeper, and if you can really sort of zone zone in and focus on your talents and work hard and be in that, then. 
you know, you've got a great chance of, of doing something. And then, as a young kid, you go, I hope that's true, you know, because you, what do you want to be? And you go, I'd love to be a footballer, like, but from Donegal, you think it's not going to happen, but I'll, I'll make them dreams yeah. anyway. And you just never know. Mm -hmm. What was the, what's the best feeling scoring a goal while saving a penalty? Probably that's as close as you'll get, mm -hmm. actually. And the goalkeeper is, is the, when you do save a penalty, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's similar to saving, to scoring a goal, I think, you know, but I don't know. I remember, I think I was at Celtic at the time, or it might have been early days of Blackburn. I went back to Donegal and I played in a, it was called the Convoy Cup just from a local team. Only came off it last time I scored a screamer from 25 yards, like, and took my top over my head and running around the field. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> Felt like I scored in the World Cup final. Like, you know, there's two men, the dog watching as well. Yeah. But it was just, I think the feeling of hitting the back of the net special, to be fair. What age did you move to Celtic? 16. So I moved moved home at 16. And that was a big shock, if I'm being honest, because as I said, Donegal, we live in the country, like, you know, nowhere near a city or nothing like that. So, to move into a big city, you know, Glasgow better than most, I'd say. So yeah. to move into a, Glasgow, a city like Glasgow, then it was it was pretty scary. I didn't do much homework or, and there wasn't much, I suppose, at that time, it's a long time ago now, but, you know, even the the webs, you know, this Google and Safari and all that wasn't wasn't on the yeah. go, you know. So I was going into the unknown, really. Um, and first year, 18 months was tough, to be fair, settling into a big city like Glasgow and, and living away from home and from all my friends and my family, you know, so... First year especially was tough, you know, but there's times I wanted to go back and just say, Oh, this is not for me. Um, this is this is too much because, you know, at that age of sixteen, as I say, seven, you're very young and you think, you know, well, all my friends and family are at home, like why why live in, in a different country and nowhere near them? You know, you can't see them at the weekend. You can't you just you're just taken away from them, you know. So but my brothers again, my family and my friends was like, This is you, you know, you, this is a chance of a lifetime, you know, you have to grab it with both hands and and you know, the homesickness will will get better. Um, and that's that's what happened, and thankfully, you know, settled in, and um, yeah, got got through it. Was that a t is that a testing time for? Because when I signed for Hibs, when we went to Edinburgh and stuff, mm. it was lonely. But I was only forty minutes know, yeah. from home, so I, know. I don't know why the fuck yeah, I was lonely. I but for yourself, being such a tight knit family, yeah. with your dad there, kind of in your ear all the time to motivate you, and yeah. always being there, is that the real struggle? for somebody trying to make it as a professional yeah. to be away from the family yeah that was a struggle yeah but again you, wanted, you didn't want to be a failure either so you didn't want to go home and go oh well you know uh, speaking in, now saying oh well I, I went to Celtic when I was 16 but I, you know I, I could have been this and I could have been that mm -hmm. you have to go and show it you have to go and prove it you know and, and even at that young age I was determined to to make a career and go to people well I'm good enough you know I will show people that I can you know make it to hopefully to the highest level and and show them what what I can do from from Donegal and 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 I think the them roots always helped as well. You know, you wanted you wanted to, I suppose, represent Donegal, represent Ireland, and represent you know your family and friends. Yeah. And you know when they're watching a game of football <clears> and you're playing and being in the World Cup finals or Champions League game or whatever it is in the Premier League or whatever game you're in, like they they've got a really strong connection to that game. I'm sure, probably for them, it's even more nervy than than me playing the game. You know, because mm -hmm. they want you to do well and. You've got work the next day or whatever, and people will be talking. He done well yesterday, or whatever that goal he should have done better. Do you know what I mean? It's all yeah. that kind of stuff, you know. So, um, but the family would be brilliant to be fair. Because it was a decision between Celtic and Manchester United. I know mm. Sir Alex has not let you live that down. <laughs> I know he's changed you for it a couple yeah. of times. But why was it the move to, to Celtic instead of Man U? Yeah, well, a couple of reasons. Mm. I think Liam Brady was the manager. Obviously, being Irish and leaving home, Packy Bonner, as you know, was the goalkeeper, who's a big legend in Ireland, of course, from Donegal as well. And the other big reason was Peter Schmeichel was at Man United. I think he'd only just joined not that long ago. And, and my dad was of the opinion, once you leave, we want to get you in the first team as quick as we can. And, and he felt that, I think Packy might have been, quote me if I'm wrong here, but 33, 34 at the time or something. So he felt like Packy's not got long left. You know, not in a bad way, just, you know, his career naturally mm -hmm. would be coming to an end and there'd be more of an opportunity to get in Celtic's first team. And that was, that's what it came down to, you know, because I think a lot of people would have been sidetrack with Man United like one of the biggest clubs in the world and all that kind of stuff and Sir Alex Ferguson obviously is an absolute legend you know so it's yeah. like why wouldn't you go there you know but I think my dad with a clear sort of vision of you know this is your career this is your pathway and this is where, where we want really, where you want you to go so he was he was a big influence on in it to be fair What did Fergie say to you <laughs> many years later did you read yeah, a charity a match or so, something yeah, Nicky Budd asked me to play in this game it's, <clears> I said Salford they opened a the new stand at Salford it was like yeah. a Salford versus, I don't know, a legend select or something like that, whatever the team was called. And, and Fergie, and he was our manager, I think, or he was, he was in there representing us that day. And he came in and he goes, can't believe you turned me down at 15. <laughs> and it's like, like 30 years ago or something, or 25 years ago. And I was like, I just even remember that, you know. Mm. But uh, I think that's what he says. The biggest thing is his memory doesn't forget anything, like, mm. you know. But 
what a what a legend he was obviously Sir Alex Ferguson I was lucky last week to play in Loch Lomond he was up there at a, at a charity thing and you know he's he's still going strong Sir Alex yeah, for sure legend man yeah, he's probably yeah. one of the greatest probably the, the greatest yeah. managers in the Premier League with the trophies that he's won how were you put on the bench you were on the bench for an old firm game you know yeah, actually you know we talk about homesickness and I, I got home I think it was Christmas New Year mm-hmm. when I was 17 and only for like a week or two because the, the school boys or the underage teams shut down over Christmas New Year but obviously the first team there it's the busiest period and I think Gordon Marshall got injured or something and I think Stuart Kerr must have been out as well so you know it was Packy Bonner was the only fit keeper they had so they had to call me back from my short stay in mm-hmm. Donegal and I was on the bench for for um, the old firm game at 17 like so it was an nervy one like what was that <laughs> experience myself. like what was that like <laughs> well obviously it was a one of the biggest games in club football, I yeah, think, Celtic definitely. Rangers. And it was like full house at Parkhead and, and I was on £100 a week. I just remember the time, you know, my wages was £100 a week and if we had a bait Rangers, it was like a grand. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to buy that. I'm going to... We lost 4-2 <laughs> and I think Mark Hately scored two or three that day and I was like, devastated. I said, I'm not going to buy that and I'm not uh-huh. going to buy that. But just the whole thing, you know, it was kind of gave me a taste of you know what could be what it could be to be a, mm-hmm. to be a first team player and stuff and you know as I say the Celtic guys were, were brilliant for me they, at a young age you know but um, the atmosphere that day and I've been to games since of course I've loved Celtic and I've been up there quite a few times and I mean the stadium at the time actually was really run down I don't know if you remember it was like yeah, average, the average jungle game stuff. Was, yeah, yeah jungle and 17 or 18 thousand you know the club's been transformed <clears> since them days but you know it's still you know the history of Celtic is is massive. You know, and to be, to be on the bench, I know I didn't play, but it was a big experience for me. Mm-hmm. So when you, how hard was it for you? Did you choose to leave Celtic, or were you released? Well, it was a funny one. Lou McCary then came on the second year, so he was my manager then. And at the end of that year, I think it was four or five of us were <clears> offered <throat> professional contracts. You know, and it was just like not very good. If I'm being honest, quite disrespectful, really. Mm-hmm. You were there for two years, and you, know, you dedicate your life, and you know yourself, you've got a chance of making it. I think you've. Yeah. You know, you're doing well in the youth team and all that kind of stuff. And um, anyway, he offered us a contract, and, and my dad's like, oh, "There's no way you're saying that because you're really influencing my dad at that young age." You know, he says you've worked the last two years, you've been away from home. There's no way you get more in the League of Ireland, like you get better paid in the League of Ireland. Yeah. You know, so we thought like any sort of negotiations would be like, you know, that that's just their opening thing. We'll, we'll they'll, they'll obviously offer you a more serious contract whenever you say mm-hmm. no. And he said, "No, that's it. You can take that or leave it." So. My dad goes, oh, we're leaving it then. We're not signing that, you know. So it was as simple and as black and white as mm-hmm. that. So we went back to Ireland and um, and then whatever, I can't remember long ago after that, then was, you know, Kenny Douglas was in touch and he brought me to Blackburn. He sent the goalkeeper. We had a tournament actually in Holland for, for the youth team, the Celtic youth team. And he sent his goalkeeping coach out, Terry Gannow, out to, uh, to watch me in this tournament. You know, I didn't even know he was there, to be honest. Mm-hmm. So Kenny must have got word about me from from his Glasgow connections, and mm. uh, he um, he signed me from Blackburn. Were you nervous leaving Celtic? Um, well, I was. It was would have been a dream to play for the first team. Mm. I would have loved to have played Lee in one game. I know I said it was on the bench, like, but actually to play in the first team would have been would have been special. Because uh-huh. um, obviously growing up a Celtic fan, that would have been special, you know. But at the same time, you know, we sort of spoke off camera. You know, I think there's there's your life sort of mapped you know, out, mapped out for you <clears> as a bit of a path, and and I think. For whatever reason, it, it wasn't meant to be there, and, and obviously took me to Blackburn, and then took me to Swindon on loan and Sunderland on loan, and then, you know, you get that experience of actually first year at Blackburn, I was on the bench a few times. Tim Flowers was the keeper, and if you remember, he was a fantastic He's a goalkeeper, great goalie. yeah, brilliant, and they won the league that year. Yeah, that Sutton, Sutton and Shearer. Yeah, I've come down from Scotland. Thinking, this Premier League's not all that. <coughs> yeah. First, like in the first year, <laughs> Blackburn just won the league, you mm-hmm. know, and I thought obviously Blackburn won the league every year, you know, but it was a obviously a one off, you know, mm-hmm. but it was even that for me the experience of them winning the league and being part of the training with the squad and stuff and bench a few times was a brilliant experience for me at a young age 18 I was you know yeah. how was that team Shearer and Sutton yeah. was it SAS they used to call yeah, them yeah. how was that when they won that league Blackburn well, was that experience for yeah. you at 18, 19 yeah it was brilliant I mean it was mad there four four two, Tim Flowers and goal you know Colin Hendry um, Tony Gale the back Ian Pierce. I don't know you go through the whole team Tim Sherry was the captain of midfield Who's a wee Scottish guy up front? Uh, Kevin Gallagher. Kevin Gallagher. Yeah, so he Gallagher, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sutton, Shearer, uh-huh. Billy McKinley. Was in the team at that time? No, I was after that. Later. Yeah, but the two wingers I remember were Ripley and Wilcox. And yeah. literally they just got out of their feet and crossed it. And obviously, as you said, Shearer and Sutton in the middle. And I mean, that goals that year, Alan was 30 something plus goals. He was just everything he touched turned to goals, you mm-hmm. know. And um, yeah, it was a nervy last day when I don't remember they lost to Liverpool away from home. but mm-hmm. I think it was a Man United that they didn't get the job done at West Ham. I think yeah, um, draw. I think yeah, oh. the goalkeeper's on fire yeah. for West Ham. So uh-huh. 
yeah, it was <clears> it was just nice to be part of that and to see the celebrations after and stuff. It was class, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because Kenny Douglas, he, he must have loved you. He took you mm. Blackburn and then Newcastle. Yeah. And then you went straight into the first team at Newcastle. Yeah, yeah I mean, again, similar to, to the... I went out loan at Swindon and then I went to Sunderland loan and the last year, I had a year left my contract and Blackburn offered me a new contract. I said, well, I want to play. And again, when I left home at 16, I wanted to be playing in the first team mm-hmm. as soon as I could. And I knew if I signed for Blackburn and extended the contract, I would have just been back up to Tim Flowers and not not got it broken to the team really because Tim yeah. was, as I say, playing for England and stuff. He was a brilliant goalkeeper and I thought, no, that's not my pathway. I want to go somewhere where I'm going to get a better chance of playing and I let my contract run down. Obviously, Kenny became the Newcastle manager and brought me there and um, gave me the number one shirt at 21 and, <clears throat> you know, the Shaka Hislop was there, Pavel Cernicek, Steve Harper. There was big competitions but, like, to give that a sort of role, whatever, give you that mm-hmm. responsibility, that young age in the Premier League was 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 a big one and I was wanting to prove that I was good enough, obviously. Young keepers don't, don't really get a chance back then, did they? No. So at 21, especially with the names behind you, that yeah. Kenny Douglas must have seen something. That yeah, yeah. Especially getting into the Blackburn team, which won the league. Newcastle team, were they not second in the yeah, league? That's right, yeah. The year before, was yeah. that with um, Keegan? Yeah. Was that when he was shouting, I would love it if we beat you? Yeah, I, I think it was, the... was that the year before or the year before? <clears> it was that, second it was twice, close. wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think it might have been the year before. Uh-huh. But yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic team. They called the entertainers and stuff, and, and yeah. Kenny came in and... Kenny got a bit of stick from the fans actually because he was he was trying to change it a little bit because obviously Keegan was a great manager. I don't get me wrong, but he was more about attacking and attacking, attacking and not really worrying about the defending side of things. So mm-hmm. I think Kenny was just trying to get the balance right, you know. But yeah, I finished second and then obviously signed for Newcastle, then playing in Champions League football. I remember the first game, I think it was Barcelona at home, you know, and it was like oh, we've arrived a bit here now, like yeah. because that was that was an unbelievable night, probably the best night at St. James I've ever experienced because we beat them and mm-hmm. the roof felt like that it was one gonna, no? No, we beat them 3 2. Did you not beat them in the New Camp one, though, as well? Yeah, uh, don't know. Did we? I don't know. Is it 3 2 at home? At yeah, so we had to... some team there. No, who I always remember for Newcastle, remember? It was a nutcase. I, he might have been a year or two years before you signed. Is that a Spreel year? Tino, uh, The Colombian oh, he there, guy. Yeah. Was he there? Yeah, yeah. What was he like? Oh, nuts. He, was he nuts? He spoke, I think he spoke better English than he let on, like, uh, but he was like, hey, uh, given, he just go, hey, given, bastardo. I was like, oh, Tino, you must know more English than that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, no, he scored a hat trick that night, so I don't know if you remember, he scored three goals against Barcelona. We're 3 0 up, we went at mm-hmm. home. Keith Gillespie was, was absolutely brilliant that night as well. He, he ragged the full back over the shot, but uh, they got back second after 3 2, so we're uh-huh. hanging on a bit at the end. But the atmosphere yeah. at St. James that night was it was just, you couldn't you couldn't hear me shout even uh-huh. this close, it was unbelievable. Like. When did Shearer sign for you? Newcastle signed. The, he was there a year before me. So he signed 15 million before yeah, you? Yeah, the year before, yeah. So you've been connected to kind of Grace Shearer yeah. kind of your whole career? Yeah. Two legends in uh, their own right, though. Yeah. For me, he's the best striker in the Premier League, Shearer. Yeah. Like, his goals, his, yeah. his, his, his presence, like, everything about him, man, yeah. like, is what I see, would see in a striker. Like, how good was Shearer? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, the thing is, probably the thing is you see whenever, I don't know, Aguero just left there in the summer to go and mm-hmm. his record, I can't remember, 100 and something. And then, I don't obviously the greatest of Robbie Fowler, I don't know, Andy Cole, all these brilliant players are up there. But then yeah. you look at Shearer, like 100 goals ahead of them all. It's kind mm-hmm. of like, how's that happened? Like, you know, he was just, I don't know, he's just a phenomenal striker and and, and and he always asked the question, nine times out of ten would ask the question from the keeper. Like, you know, he'd always hit the target with ferocity and pace and power, like, you know, and um, I don't know, he's just, just a fantastic striker and um, great guy as well. Actually, you know, I think people look at him in match of the day and think of, he's a bit boring or he's a bit, like, yeah. straight, like, you know, but well, off camera and stuff, he's always messing mm-hmm. and, you know, playing tricks on people and he's got a good sense of humour, right? What was Big Duncan Ferguson like? Oh, he was a legend, Duncan. <laughs> he's a fucking nutcase, man. He is. I think there's people, every time somebody breaks out of his house, he just batters them. <laughs> no, the, the funny story was after when they did remember, there's a, there's a picture in the front page of one of the newspapers the next day. Do not break into this man's house for pictures of <laughs> Duncan staring down the camera, I guess. Yeah. But it was, uh, no, I mean, he, when he was fit, like he was some player as well. So with Shear and Ferguson up front yeah. at one point, like, and they were, they were phenomenal, like, you know, so it was. Um, yeah, great guy as well. Great yeah. guy. Yeah, he get fucked over with SFA in Scotland, man. Yeah, strange, on the pitch, man. Yeah, was, mm-hmm. like, what a player, man. He just left his country, really, mm-hmm. rightly so, for yeah, what they did, yeah. man. He ended up getting the jail. But I always remember with him and Jamie Bullard. Yeah, I think Jamie yeah. Bullard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jamie Bullard up, shit himself. Yeah, but he's uh, but what a player, big dunk was yeah. for Everton and Newcastle. Yeah, yeah. Like, the same with Shearer. What was Les Ferdinand like? I didn't play actually with Les. The summer I joined was the summer Les left. He left. Yeah, yeah. So I've obviously met him at loads of games and stuff and since. And mm-hmm. he 
he was actually playing like Bloomin last week as well. Actually, funny guy, like really yeah. quite relaxed, funny, good, good, good temperament, like you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, some I've been lucky to play with some great players over the years, you know, and definitely Shears up there with with, with, with one of the best, yeah. Because you were at Newcastle for twelve years, obviously mm-hmm. through so many managers there was over mm-hmm. ten, twelve or thirteen managers you went with there. Well, that's a, a long lot, time. Yeah. So even Kenny Dalglish, the like, managers who see potential and see. And give you the chance for your career. Mm. See when these guys leave, is that hard to adapt to new managers and new styles? Well, it's hard, and it's not. It's not. It's not, it's not easy because the guys brought you in, and so he's like, mm. he doesn't have to play, but you know he'd be under a little bit of pressure. Well, you brought this guy in, you know, so there's a good chance that he wants to back you and, and support you and get you in the team or whatever. But when he goes, then it's 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 kind of a clean slate for everyone then because a new manager comes in, and, and that's normally what the new manager says as well. Yeah, I'm here. You know, I don't care what's happened with the previous manager. It's a clean slate for everyone. You know, we, I watch you in training. Whoever trains the best will play in the team, you know. So I think that gets everyone going, here we go. Like, so we're, we're sort of back to square one, no matter what you've done for the previous guy. You know, yeah, you'll have, like, people like Shear and stuff, maybe Gary Speed at the time. You know, people will definitely be starters, you know. But at the same time, there's players who are maybe on the on the verge of maybe not playing, you know. So it gives everyone a kick up the backside. What was Rutil at like? <laughs> he's okay I mean looking <clears throat> back now he turned up and wanted to play sexy football that was his famous quote I think when he he got the job I just I just didn't fall out with him like, but I wasn't overly happy I played in the FA Cup final and then he the following over. season he, did, he didn't play me you know and I played in all the games up to it and he didn't even tell me like he got the goalkeeping coach to tell me which I felt was cowardly cowardly at least yeah at least at least have the balls to, to tell me I'm not playing like you know what I mean be it <clears throat> right or wrong or you can disagree with him like but I don't think he should have sent the goalkeeping coach to tell me that I wasn't playing, you know, especially in a big game like that. It was and played in every other game. It was, it was, it was, a, it was frustrating. Yeah, yeah, because you played in every game up to the cup final and get dropped yeah. to the FA Cup final. Yeah. Does that still sting with you just now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I played in the previous cup final of the year before as well. We lost to Arsenal, and then I played in every game up to the semi final against Man United the, the next season. You know, and I think I didn't play in the league game before or two league games before, and then. Obviously, there was a decision to make for the final, you know, and he stuck with Steve Harper, and 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 that's his choice. As I say, it's, it's more just the the frustrating thing when you play all the games you do well in the semi final, you, you you feel that you're one of the reasons they're in the final. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then you don't play, you know. So that's yeah, it's not it's not a nice feeling, is it? Does that looking back that like, that must be the difficult thing? So all you want to do as a kid is win trophies, mm-hmm. like when then it plays in your mind thinking back, fuck, if I, if I played, we could have won. Mm-hmm. Is that? Least. Yeah, probably not so much. It's probably more because I was there mm-hmm. such a long time, and mm-hmm. even now since I've left as well, the Newcastle fans they haven't won a trophy from since I don't know fifty or sixty years. You know, it's yeah. it's a frustrating thing because your job as a player is to win them a trophy because that's all they want. That's all they want is a trophy. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it was more a, a a disappointment of letting them down, and and of course not not doing that. Like, you know, we got close in the league a couple of times. We got to you know semi final UEFA Cup and two finals of the FA Cup. You know, we're just just nearly there, you know, and it just it, that was a frustrating thing for me that we didn't actually have something to show for. Yeah, who was after Rutil? Was it Sunis? When did Sunis come in? I don't know. Who was Sunis the manager? I think Sunis came in after Bobby Robson. Yeah. I think. How was I? Yeah. Uh, Sunis was after Robson because Robson came in because you were with Robson for yeah. six years. Yeah, he fought the world of you. Yeah, he was a good guy. Yeah, I mean his man management skills was probably the uh-huh. best, one of the best I've seen. You know, getting mm-hmm. the best out of people. You know, as I say, you don't have like ten Ronaldos or ten Messi's or whatever. You have to have a mix of a team, individuals, I don't know, mentality, you know, and he could he could read someone's personality and get the best out of them, be it like, you know, you probably heard this before, but kick up the backside or an arm around, around them, what what, yeah. what they needed to be the best on a Saturday, you know, so I think Bobby had the balance on that really, really, really spot on. Yeah, because you, you probably had your, one of your best spells under Bobby, I think you finished like, third, fourth, and then fifth I think it was or second, three third, seasons. fourth and fifth or yeah. something like that, or so third, fourth and fifth uh-huh. or whatever, and he was like, <clears> he got sacked when he finished fifth, you know, so, I'm sure if you asked a Newcastle fan now if he finished fifth, would you take that? You know, they would probably snap your hand off, you know. But yeah, it was, I think, Bobby's age and stuff. And then there was talk about, you know, he's losing the dressing room and some of the players are sort of running a bit of a muck, you know. And that's why soon mm-hmm. as brought in to try and straighten a few people out, you know. But again, it's a fine line between, you know, m- you know, getting the man managing right and, and getting it wrong. And I don't think he got it wrong, if I'm being honest. I think he, he had it right and we just... I think we missed out by a point or something. It wasn't like we missed out by ten points or whatever. Yeah. It was close to, to finish fifth, you know. So um, he would, he was really gutted about that, and rightly so, because he mm-hmm. felt he, he deserved another season. Soon as again another Scotsman, another nutcase. Yeah. Like, what was he like to work under? He was good to say he was brought on a wee bit, sort of James, to, to try and 
because there's younger players like Bellamy and Dyer and and maybe players like that who who were maybe people at the club felt were getting ahead of themselves, you know. But um, I think he offered to Bellamy out one day in a meeting as well. <laughs> 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 he tried to drag him out of the the seat in the meeting to, to take him into the office or something, you know. But to be fair to Bellamy, he wasn't for backing down, like you know. So he was he was up for it as well, but. I think his staff stepped in and, and sort of broke it up, you know. But yeah, I wouldn't want to fight Graham either. He's he's obviously, you know, what he's like as a player and, and I think, you know, as a manager he's very strong minded. But at the same time I think he was fair as well. I think he was a fair manager and, and, and you know, he just wanted the best for the club and, and he felt that maybe some fellas need ruffling and he was he was going to ruffle them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what he's good at. Is, um, yeah. How was Bellamy? Because what a player, what a pace, yeah. great finisher. He was at Celtic and he was phenomenal yeah, yeah. as well. That yeah. great player that he obviously seems a nippy character where he just seems like if he's on your side he's for you but if yeah. you're against him he'd, he'd be a little fucker yeah I've got a lot of time for Craig actually you know and people maybe read again media and stuff and papers and think oh he's this and he's that you know but he's probably one of the most dedicated players I've played with from a professional point of view and from like he's always last in the gym he's always first in training he's always in the afternoon doing sessions on his own and stuff and you know he is really dedicated you know but going back to Bobby he was he was the man who got the best out of him you know because you see him going over because Bellamy and Shear didn't get on that well, I don't think. And he was like, you're doing all his run. He's an old man. He's just sort of standing in there and blah, 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 blah. And keep doing it. You're the key man in the team and all this kind of stuff. And then I go to Shear, I go, don't mind him. He's a wee mouthpiece. Like, just mm -hmm. get you in the middle of the goal. You'll get the goals. And then on a Saturday, they just clicked together and, and got lots of goals together, you know. And again, that's down to Bobby Robson and to, to get the best out of both individual people who are probably totally different in mindsets, really. What was it like making your first appearance for Ireland? Yeah, I was only 19. I was in loan at Sunderland at the time and I think the keepers, Packy got injured and Alan Kelly got injured, the other goalkeepers. And I think there was other goalkeepers that Mick McCarthy could have called up, but he, he, he I was doing well at Sunderland and, you know, I have to thank him a lot for actually going, right, we'll put this guy in, we'll get him over and, and mm. we'll, give him his, we'll give him his opportunity. So it was just a special feeling, you know, all my family was up from Donegal, my, my cousins and aunties and uncles, I think they, they took about 50 tickets that night, but... You know, when you're 19, it's kind of like, you know, this could be your only cap. You see, loads of people have made one cap for the country, so we weren't, they weren't going to miss it, you know, but it was just a special feeling to walk out of the old Lansdowne Road. Now, I know it's the Aviva now, and the stadium's changed a lot since then, but walk out of the old Lansdowne Road. I used to go there as a fan myself and sort of watch the Jack Charlton era, and then now to walk out there as a as the number one goalkeeper in Ireland, it was it was just, it was a bit surreal, if I'm being honest. You know, you, 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 the stuff of dreams, and that's probably all a bit corny as well, but it, it genuinely was because... I used to look up to some of the guys that were looking along the line. Some of the guys that were, were my heroes, and now we're, you know, like likes of getting changed in the changing room. Paul McGrath on one side and Roy Keane on the other side, and I'm in the middle, sort of keeping my head down and the boots on, thinking, if I took a wrong turn here or something, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But uh -huh. it's it's you know some great players in there, and and, and just some special feeling to play for your country. Yeah, that must have been proud. Yeah, he must have been buzzing. Yeah, like to see your potential. And I've watched a few of your interviews, and your dad speaks very highly of you, yeah. but. The decisions and he he kind of guided you the right way and you seem to listen to everything your dad says but when you walked out and get that Irish jersey on like, yeah. that must have been a different feeling yeah. from anything yeah hey, my dad's always been a big Irish fan even before like obviously I played and stuff mm -hmm. he always used to go to all the games and you know he'd take me out of school when I was a kid and bring me a, you know normally a Wednesday midweek games whatever and we'd go up together and you'd miss half a day at school and you'd be but like just genuine Irish supporters like you know so I've been brought up that way and I remember when I signed for Blackburn, actually, I had a busy day. It was like a medical and, and blah, blah, blah. And we had a game that night, just a friendly pre-season friendly, because Akron and Stanley, you know, local team to Blackburn. And I think we lost 3-2 out of beast for two of the goals, nightmare, like. And uh, I signed the contract that day. And it was just one of them days. It was just hectic, like, you know, getting everything done and then straight onto the pitch. And the first person I met the next morning was Kenny Dalglish. And he was like... Good job you signed that contract yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then he goes to me, to be fair, he said, well, he's only he's only pulling my leg, he said. He said, mm -hmm. but he says, You'll get that. He says in football, he says, What don't ever get too hard on yourself and don't get too carried away as well. He says, You'll get great games and you'll have poor games. And he says, just just try and keep a level head, you know. But that same time my dad was over for the few days of the signing and stuff, and he goes, Mark my words, he'll play for Ireland before he's twenty. And I made my debut when I was on 19. March when I was 19 yeah, yeah. I, was, I was going to be 20 the next month like you know but you know as if my dad had some sort of crystal ball like you know mm -hmm. but he obviously had faith in me but 
I was still lucky to make my debut at 19, you know. Yeah, that's the only thing. If people have got the backing and believe in you, that, that's, that mm. currency is better than anything mm, in the world. Like, yeah, class. You start believing in yourself almost yeah. and you start to start to believe something, then those things definitely manifest into 100%, happening. Yeah, like, yeah definitely. Newcastle as well, they've never been short of controversy. Like, the, mm. the scrapping on the pitch with Lee Boyer and was it Dyer? Yeah. Lee Boy was a firecracker on his self and he's a little nutcase he came from Leeds did he not yeah was... and um, what are you thinking then when you see I think you were already a man sent off were you not no we ended up in Norman uh, after that sent uh, off so um, you had three yeah, players sent off yeah, that game yeah ended up with eight players yeah we lost, we lost I think it was 3-0 in the end but yeah it was just you know obviously fights can break out I mean probably less so now back in the day maybe it was a bit more frequent like mm -hmm. but but I was with the opposition players, not with your own teammates, like, you know, so it just, it was a bit surreal. It was a bunch of <laughs> balls over there and next thing, the, the sort of ring stopped and looked over to my right and it was just, there was haymakers flying in from, from mm -hmm. all angles and, and I think I remember it was Gareth Barry tried to split them up from the opposition team, like, you know, and I remember Boyer's top was down there somewhere, wasn't it? It was like ripped yeah. to shreds and stuff and obviously the ref took out two red cars and like, it was just like, oh, I just remember Alan, Alan Shearer after the game, he was just going bananas, like, what the fucking hell are you two doing? And, let the fans down, let us down, let everybody down, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think it got to the bottom of it, it was just something so ridiculous, it was one didn't pass the other, and then it was like, mm -hmm. oh, fuck you, and then I'll fuck you, and then it was like, before you know it, like, they're <laughs> literally just piling into each other, you know, yeah. so, I mean, it was just a mad, a mad one to, to yeah. get into, yeah. You know, you wouldn't see that now, it's not clean cut, but they're still, tempers aren't as, as crazy and ruthless as they were back in the day, like, I, mm -hmm. what I remember as a premiership, in the 90s, early 2000s, when it was, like your bear camps and your Vieras and your Roy mm. Keens and everything was fiery and there was more passion. Yeah. Everything's kind of getting cut out that now. Yeah, the VAR and all yeah, that stuff. People know it, they're on the cameras are on yeah. them all the time, you know. So but I think people liked a bit of bit of that back in the day. I think they liked a bit of That's know, a football, I know. Yeah. I remember what Dennis was, White uh, used to pick people up by the shoulder and nip <laughs> them and stuff. And yeah. yeah Vinny Jones, because yeah. you do not make your de debut against yeah. uh, Vinny yeah. Jones Wimbledon. Yeah, I was I was I think it was Tim got injured or I was sick the morning of the game and I was due to be on the bench. I was nineteen again and he was um yeah, I think he I don't know if he had an injury coming now or he was sick. So basically I'm I'm playing and I make my Premier League debut away at Selhurst Park like against the crazy gang, like, you know. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bit of a baptism of fire, like but I don't know if you've been down there to change them, it's not really changed that much mm -hmm. over the years, but the crazy gang was the first sort of teams to have the the ghetto blaster blasting. When I mean blasting, mm -hmm. like the walls and the up, the way team was vibrating, like you know, and you could hear them shouting and screaming and coming out the tunnel. And Tim Sher was the captain, and Vinnie Jones and Fashion and all these big massive guys were shouting, "Let's get into this young keeper. He's, he's shitting himself. He's this. He's that." Mm -hmm. And Tim was sort of laughing because he'd been around the block and he was saying, "Oh, don't mind. They're just trying to wind you up." Like, but at the same time, it can be intimidating because yeah. the tunnels about this width as well. Selhurst yeah. Park to the right next to you, like you know, mm -hmm. that's mad. Like, you do see Vinnie Jones and you do see a cycle. Yeah, like when we were doing back then, where the crazy gang, yeah. they were ruthless. You used to see old videos when we used to set all the players. Um, tracksuits and fire and stuff like they were fucking wild yeah, you could yeah. do that shit yeah. now man like <laughs> HR being involved yeah. in that <laughs> you know what I mean like looking back then like that's what I remember I was still only 10 maybe 12 back then in the 90s of the football but that's what I remember like, as has been a tough sport people getting with the studs mm. and people not really caring mm -hmm. like even I think soon as I don't know if it was against Aberdeen I was at Liverpool again someday it went right through and done them mm. high tackle right through yeah. and he only got a booking yeah yeah do you know what I mean people like, ah, somebody's going to talk and go yeah, get on yeah, with that yeah. next one you get a booking but yeah. um, I think that's <clears throat> it's taken out of the game but now it's a bit like some kinds of can nearly be too short I mean good example last week was when Harvey Elliott you know, it's a, it's a, obviously he got a bad injury you know but you know it wasn't a red card but because the injury was, was there and the cameras and all different angles he goes oh that's a red card but even he said it wasn't a red card, you know, but back in the day, that would have been mm -hmm. maybe yellow at worst, you know, so the game has changed a lot and they say it's for the safety of players, you know, but I think the, in the back of your brain, all the fans, are like, oh, they love it, so they used to love yeah. a 50-50, didn't they? Like when two yeah. players were just going heather and tongue mm -hmm. for the ball, you know, and best man won, wasn't it? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, you do miss that because everybody loves combat sports, everybody loves boxing, or yeah. MMA, like, yeah. they love a bit of nitty gritty, but it's kind of get took out the game, the game's not boring, but it's more, I don't know, man. Things have changed a lot. It I think seems this year, to be fair, the refs had a bit of a sort of get together in the summer, <clears> and they said like last year, like there's people falling over, and it was they were giving fouls for everything. I think this year they've actually made a yeah. conscious decision to try and give less uh -huh. fouls and let let play go <clears> on, and you know, even stuff in the box. You can see people getting pulled over and falling <clears> down, and 
they were given maybe penalties last year for that and they're maybe letting them get on with it a bit more, which I think is better, you know. Definitely. 2002, the Japan, was it Japan and Korea World Cup? Yeah. You were flying. Did you just think is finish the group stages undefeated? Yeah, we, well, was I think it, we beat, I think to get there, we beat uh, Holland? Holland, actually, yeah. I yeah. remember that. That was like a mad <clears> game, but the atmosphere that day was probably the best at Lansdowne I've ever experienced. You know, we got a man sent, Gary Kelly got sent off, we mm -hmm. half an hour to go and... We were Jason McAteer scored, we had 10 men, and then Van Gaal was sticking every centre forward in Holland on the pitch. Like, if I don't know that Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank was on, I think Van Hoydonk was on, Bergkamp, all these overmars, all these players. Mm -hmm. It was like, next time I looked over, the kitchen sink was coming on, like, you know, <laughs> but we managed yeah. to hang on, like, and we, we, we knocked them out that day. They couldn't qualify after that. They had to beat us, and obviously mm -hmm. we beat them, and we were into a playoff then with, with Iran, which was a mad game as well. We home and away against Iran, you know, and out there was a crazy place with 100,000 fans there it was just was it? nuts man yeah they were in five hours before the game and there was just no women allowed all this kind of stuff and I just remember getting warmed up before the game there's these like mad you know them like firecracker things going off like, mm -hmm. but they were like when they hit the ground they were the noisiest thing you'd ever hear and, like, and yeah. it was like <clears throat> warm up one was like about 10 yards oh, that was fine and one landed next to me the dirt hit me in the face and I was like I was about too close for comfort that like mm -hmm. you know but we managed to get get through. We actually lost. They scored in the last kick of the game, but we managed to get through two one in aggregate. And I think just the realization that that we're going to the finals, World Cup finals, was just wow. Because I said to you before about the Jack Charlton era, we were, we were I was a fan growing up and watching them, and then the, the realization that wow, you're going to be going now, and there's going to be kids growing up in Ireland thinking, well, I'm, I'm the next Shea Given or mm -hmm. commentating because I used to do next Packy Bonner in the front garden, you know. And it's it's mad how life the full circle. It was kind of like now it's my my time to go and, and represent Ireland and just the you know it's, it's it's the best stage the biggest stage you can be on yeah the World Cup was that the first time Ireland since 1994 yeah it was a, there was a gap obviously yeah and that you know I mean <clears> to be fair to Jack Shelton and, and, and his team they were absolutely brilliant and and maybe a little bit lucky as well because the, the, the crop of players they had you know were all playing at obviously Packy was at Celtic winning trophies of, you know there was all these players in the, in the Premier League and not just at smaller clubs, at Liverpool, Man United, and all the mm -hmm. big clubs. And, and, you know, there's less players. Now you look at the squad now, there's a lot of less players even in the Premier League, never mind the big clubs in the Premier League, you yeah. know. So Jack was lucky in that sense. But but again, he's a hero, Jack Shelton in Ireland as well. You know, what he'd done with that team and mm -hmm. qualified for Euros, World Cup finals and stuff. And yeah, it was great memories. We were kids, obviously, we're mm -hmm. following him and supporting him. Yeah. It was fantastic. You just had some team though in 2002, yourself, you had Roy Keane, Damien Duff. Mm. Robbie Keane, mm -hmm. uh, McAteer was a player as well. That yeah. you had a strong fucking yeah. outfit. That like, seeing you were getting into it because pe people were expecting you to actually go far. Mm -hmm. And that tournament, obviously, when you got the turmoil with Roy Keane and that, how does that unsettle a changing room? Because I watched a few yeah. interviews and a lot of people says that it was you who's came to the forefront mm -hmm. to kind of put it back together mm -hmm. when you were doing the huddle and stuff. Like, yeah, well, we, you know, it was such big <clears> news. Obviously, Roy Keane leaving. He's not just a brilliant player; he's your captain. You know, he's on a week or two before the World Cup final start. You know, he's probably one of the main reasons he got there in the first place was performances against like the likes of Holland. I think it'd be a great result against Portugal as well in the qualifying, and he was probably the man of the match in both of them games. Yeah. You know, so to lose someone of that stature and that caliber, then it was it was a big blow. Um, and but the only thing we did did sort of say as a group together, we go, well, we'll we have to be we have to come together, and as you say the huddle or whatever the group togetherness that. We've got the upper game even more now because we've lost one of our best players, you know, and we've got to show the people it's not just the Roy Keane team, it's, it's, it's Ireland, but us as a group of players, you know, we, we've got to go out and represent the rest of the country and we want to sh we want to do them proud. Yeah, because Ireland is a small nation, they're passionate. Mm. The Irish, like, like, <clears throat> you don't fuck about with the Irish, man, especially <laughs> when it comes to the sports. Like, yeah. They love their football, you know, yourself, their, their rugby, everything. Yeah. They, they get behind their team or anybody who's from there and they're in mm. with any event that they're in the world was back 100% so when you're going through there and you've got Spain was it the last 16 mm. did you, know, you saved a couple of penalties and it, it no I went to penalties in the end we, we, I didn't actually save any in the end but the, the game we had two penalties in the game Yeah, Ian Hart who's probably got the best one of the best left foot in football mm -hmm. thing, when he whips the ball to the, so he does a full whip with his left foot there's no keeper in the world saving it and he got a penalty in the game and he was a penalty taker never missed a penalty for Ireland before mm. And for whatever reason, like the pressure of the World Cup, I don't know what, he changed his mind running up to the thingy and he went to the keeper's right and Casillas saved it, you know. Yeah. We got another penalty in the game and Robbie Keane stepped up and he scored it. Like, But, mm -hmm. you know, had we scored the first one as well, we, we would have beat Spain. And and people might, looking back, Ireland beating Spain after after that, then they went on to win the World Cup, <coughs> the European Championship. Yeah. Like, we were that close and 
the last 10 minutes, I think they got a guy who was injured, so they, they finished with a man left. So they were actually knocking the clock down to get the penalties, you know. Mm-hmm. The frustrating thing for me is I didn't save a penalty, and that was the, that was the thing, because going back to supporting Ireland and Packy, of course, from Donegal, he saved the penalty against Romania, and, and it was like he was a hero, still is a hero yeah. on, on the back of that, you know, so it was my time to shine, and I, I didn't... I didn't save one, you know, so that that was the bit that wrangled with me. Albeit we missed our first three penalties, had a had a save one, it wouldn't have made a big difference. But you know, still psychologically had a had a save one of the earlier penalties, and it might have changed things, and it just didn't. That was the that was the gutting thing for me, really. How does that affect footballers coming back from big tournaments like that and then getting put out so mm. narrowly that it mm. could have went either way? It's a flip of a coin. Like, how does it come back you've got to pick your spirits up straight away after that because I know you had the conversation with Kenny Douglas and he says look take the highs and the lows like, mm. don't get yourself yeah. so low that yeah. it's over but how how did that affect you because you seem to bounce back quite fast yeah the yeah, usual I mean, player yeah I think um, went away for a break whatever after that and obviously it's a shortened break because of the World Cup's on and takes up your summer holidays and what, but I think the good thing about football and any sport you've, you've you know you've you just get back on the bike again don't you? you you've got to prepare then for the Premier League campaign the next one coming along and whatever it was, Champions League, League Cups, all that. So the, the, the fixtures come thick and fast, you know, and you can't really dwell of what could have been or what might have been. Yeah, after the World Cup for a few weeks, you're, you're thinking about it and looking back now, all these years ago, 20 years later, you're still thinking about it now, but at the time when you're actually in the zone of, you know, playing week in, week out, then you have to really focus on each game. So you've got to get on with the next game, really. Mm-hmm. How did the players react to Roy Keane leaving as well? Did that... Mm-hmm. Was everybody fine with him after it? I was he kind of disappointed that your captain kind of left you. Uh, yeah, I think it was probably a mixed bag, really. Um, yeah, I think probably disappointed me personally. I can only speak for myself. I mean, it was was disappointing to lose him. Yeah, I mean, he was a brilliant player. There's no getting away from that. And yeah, you had a bit of a I don't know a side. Of, I don't know what to, what's the right word to call it. Like an angry side to him, or, or a side that you wouldn't want to get in the wrong side of him, I suppose. But at the same time, I'd rather have him in my team than. The not of my team, you know, and I'm sure if you sat right down in one of these situations and maybe you will one day, then you no, know, he, he might not admit that he regrets it, but I'm sure deep down he, he probably wish he had have not not done worked out the way it did work out, you know, because um, it's just a big loss to the country that, that your best player, I suppose, wasn't there. And it would have been interesting to see, even against we talk about losing to Spain, you know, had Roy Keane be playing that night, you know, could it have been so more different? And, yeah. and then you can dream on about. <clears throat> What next? Because the run up to the final was—I know you might think, "Oh, dreamland of the final." But if you beat Spain and the belief you get off the back of that, going into the next one, you know, the quarter final, whatever, then it's a snowball effect, isn't it? And it just would have been interesting to see what we would have been like with him in the team. Yeah, because he's a phenomenal player, the best yeah. probably midfielder. If I was having a, if I was the manager team, that's the kind of guy I yeah. would want in the centre mid. Yes, the intimidation, yeah. like just looking at him. even now, he's interviews he intimidates yeah, people yeah. on the TV. Like, the tunnel, like he seems to have relaxed now that he's got older a bit. He's starting to smile a yeah, bit more. Yeah. But even in it, because I think in the '94 World Cup, was he not voted Ireland's best player? Mm. Yeah, he was young then, then as well. When he was young. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he 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 set standards in training and stuff. He was yeah. he was just, I don't know, just obviously being at Man United, winning trophies. He was he was. We all looked up to him in a sense because he was such a great player and um and, and our captain and leader. And it's just it's just a shame. Like there's no way of sitting here now and saying he was right, he was wrong, blah blah blah. You know the the, the sort of cold light of day. Then you know we wish it hadn't happened. Nobody wish it had to happen. We wish we had had him and. You know, we wish we could have maybe went further in, in the World Cup. Yes, can you imagine it with the way you're feeling with him doing that? Can you imagine the way he feels? Mm. Like, that was the last major tournaments that he would have played in, like, mm. and he never got to do that. So he'll need to live with that because he's island through and through. Mm. His blood is Yeah, green. that's what I'm saying. It'd be interesting to see if he, if he maybe off camera or on regrets. camera, if you see what, it, what he really said deep down, you know. But yeah, you see, he's got to live with it. It's his decision, and I'm sure there's this part of him definitely sort of regrets leaving for sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Who was Big McCarthy? Yeah, I like Mike a lot. Yeah, <clears throat> um, as I say, gave him a debut, and um, when he could have given other people, he could have played other people. There's older keepers who, who he could have picked, you know. But you know, Mick's dead honest. He's honest as the day's long. He sort of tells you how it is, and and you know, he's still over a thousand games now in club management and, and stuff. He's absolutely. You know, he's 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 a fantastic manager and I've got a lot of time for him. Um, you know, him and Roy did clash, I think, even when they were players and stuff, and I think Roy's man for holding a bit of grudges and stuff. So mm-hmm. I think he never really let that go really. But you know, I can only speak for myself. Mick Mick was had a lot of time for me and I've got a lot of time for him. He's he's a good manager. Yeah. I d I don't want to get you would never want to get this bad side of Roy Keane. Even uh, I had Andy Gorham on as well and 
he was saying when Andy Gorham obviously played for Rangers and he was saying for Man U when Man U were going through their troubles mm. with goalkeeper injuries and um, uh, Andy was getting introduced to all the players and then everybody was shaking his hand and then it came to Roy Keane <laughs> Roy Keane done not shake his hand and, <laughs> and he's like ah, is that the way it's going to be he's like ah, yeah there's not really any point as they're shaking hands and, <laughs> and Andy's like ah, fair just enough he just went on for three months Andy was there yeah. and not once did ever speak wow fucking ruthless the man <laughs> absolute ruthless <laughs> but, but that's the man you would want in your centre mid. Like, yeah. That's what it's all about for me. Like the, the passion, the, the thrive. Like you can the amount of trophies the guys won. I think he's won like nineteen or twenty yeah. trophies. Like unbelievable. And as you say, he's in the middle of the park. Like he's there, your engine room. Yeah, he bosses it from there. Mm-hmm. You got a bad injury. Was, was it Herwood? Who was it? Came through. Yeah, you? yeah. I've, I've had a fair few injuries in my time, but the worst would have been the Herwood one. Yeah, he's a big unit as well. Yeah, yeah. It was away at West Ham and the old Upton Park and. I think it was like five minutes ago where we were at Newcastle at the time we were leading 2-1 and it was like a 50-50 but maybe more 60-40 in my favour and it was a wet day I remember I come sliding out and I could see him coming sliding in with his two feet like and I was like this is, this is not going to end well but the most important thing I was was getting the football like you know but to be fair to Marlon I think what happened he knew I had the ball and he tried to pull out of it so he pulled his pulled his studs away basically to, 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 I suppose try and protect mm-hmm. me a little bit but what he did do his two knees come crashing into my ribs at full pace like you know and Obviously, punctured my bowels, rushed to hospital, and yeah, I woke up in a hospital in London the next day with tubes coming out my nose and every part of my body, and obviously I got a big scar down in the middle of my stomach. They had to do an emergency Shit. operation and, and fix me, you know, my perforated bowel, like you know. So, you know, you never think that going to play football that you, you was in London for a week in, in the hospital, you know, not let, leave the hospital bed basically, you know. So, yeah, I mean that's that's part of sport, isn't it? You know, you you probably have interviewed a lot of other people with a lot worse injuries than that, but that was pretty pretty scary because the specialist is the only time he's ever seen that before was with a car crash you know because when you pile into the steam if you have a really hefty car crash you know so um i was lucky the specialist was actually a west ham fan he was at he was at the ground that day and he brought me straight to the hospital and saturday night operated on me like could you have died could have died yeah we we're due to fly back it was a strange because we were due to fly back that night to newcastle obviously we, we flew up and down to london and had I got on the plane, had it because what <clears> happened was I was really badly wounded. Three minutes to go, and I couldn't continue. And the doctor and the team brought me off the pitch, and but it wasn't it wasn't punctured at that point, or whatever, or maybe it was late leaking into my system. So basically, when your bowel punctures, it's like acid pouring into your stomach. <clears throat> so I said to the doctor, "Um, oh, is just they get my breath back." I think I think I just might have maybe broke a rib or something. Didn't know what it was, obviously. <clears throat> she says, "I'll just have a shower and get you dressed. We'll see how you're after." And then after the shower, I just go, "This is not good. This is not good." I just felt like somebody was stabbing me in the stomach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And literally collapsed on the bed, the medical bed, and passed out, like totally wiped out, like, you know. So obviously the lads told me after what happened, there was people running for ambulances and doctors and whatever else. It was like a you know, the players seeing that was would have been bad as well because I was out of it, like, you know. So yeah, yeah it was pretty <clears throat> scary. But had that of not sort of busting the system I was up in the air in the plane, then it could have been could have been scary. Yeah, yeah. scary. Because you've had a few moments, um, life threatening moments, because we're not in a a hotel or a restaurant and somebody's come in with a shotgun and, and fired one yeah, off in the yeah. ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where we stayed in Port Marnock, there's, there's, there's like, we were eating underneath the reception and there's stairs down underneath and the, the restaurant where we were at was down here, the players and that. And next time we hear like shouting and commotion upstairs and then the gun went off like, guys pelted like into the roof with a double barrel shotgun or something. We're like, oh, fucking hell, what's that like? So then we're thinking, if he comes down here now, we need to, so we all scamper down to, there's a back way out to the rooms and stuff, you know, scampered away in case he's, in case he's, but he just came in to rob the hotel basically, you know, but we weren't sure if he's doing the hotel and coming down to try and rob us or whatever, I don't know, you just don't know what, mm-hmm. what he's going to do, like, you know, but, uh, yeah, there's a few, uh, few uh, worried faces in there. <laughs> <laughs> you would shit yourself. You would, uh? I've been at uh, gun ranges and stuff, man, the shotgun is loud. It's loud. They're yeah. loud. So yeah. if you're thinking, fuck me, what is that? Oh, yeah. And then he's shouting and get down, all that kind of yeah. stuff, and blah, blah, blah. You're thinking, he could come around this corner and down them stairs. Like, what are we doing yeah. then? <laughs> How was it when you because Newcastle, you had most, one of the most appear, appearances in mm. Newcastle history, I think, second or third. Like, yeah, yeah. You're only 20 or 30 behind the leading. Yeah. How was that to leave instead of kicking on and being the number yeah, one? Yeah, that, that was a big thing. Um, you know, I could have stayed and broke the record. I think it was, you say, it was 20 or 30. I can't remember the exact figure, James, but I was 20 or 30. Not that load, loads of appearance behind the all-time record appearance holder for Newcastle. So that would have been a special to get that, of course, and, and I suppose tell the grandchildren or whatever. But at the same time, it was, I've always said this, even in the book, I've done a book, and it was like, 
the thing about Newcastle when I joined, finished second, uh, you know, the previous season second in the Champions League <clears> football, <throat> like that's that's the club I joined, and then you know when Mike Ashley took over, it was all about. I don't know. It was no. There was no um, ambition for the club to challenge for anything really. His his, I think his remit and still is to this day is to keep the club in the Premier League and, and just keep it afloat and not really have a go for for anything, you know. And at the time when I was there, they've, they've spent a wee bit in the last couple of years. But when I was there, they were selling all the best players and bringing free transfers in. And I'm thinking this is not the this is not the club I joined like you know all them years ago and. And I felt I'd done my time, and I felt that you know when Man City came calling, it was like it was good to get an opportunity. They were a club, you know, going places and and wanting to challenge. Obviously, you know, they were just at the start of the sort of the journey they were on from from where they where they were. You know, yeah. Caldun and Sheikh Mansour just came in. I think the year before, you know, the previous one they signed Robinho, and now they want to sign me. You know, I'm thinking this is a club with huge ambitions. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and I always felt that they could sign any goalkeeper in the world because they could. They had the finances to do that, and then they wanted me. So I was like, I can't not turn that down. And yeah, what I wish I had a broke the appearance record, but at the same time, these opportunities in life sometimes don't come along. They might never come along again. They might have yeah. signed someone else the following summer. So, you know, I wanted to go and follow that opportunity, mm -hmm. really. Because you're a Newcastle legend, they love you there. Twelve years you spent mm. over six hundred, over five hundred appearances, or four over six hundred you've done the whole yeah. career, but nearly five hundred for Newcastle. That's they loved you there. Like twelve yeah. years, the saves. Like I was watching your videos last night. The saves, like there's the Zidane free kick as well, and yeah. um, like, I think it was a Newcastle player. It was nearly an OG, but it fucking scaled the top yeah, of your head yeah, yeah. the bar. You're thinking yeah. like you don't realise how good a keeper you actually were until you start. Yeah. Watching you, you go fuck me like what I keep because I know the Celtic fans are still a bit better yeah. with um because they think it's Lou McCarry who mm. pushed you away and like ah, how can um push a world class goalie away because you know you're a massive Celtic fan as yeah. well. So Yeah, that was that was a that was a frustrating thing, you know, because he didn't actually say we really want you to keep you. It was kind of yeah. like, oh, don't worry, just leave then, it's fine, no problem. Yeah. That was probably more Lou McCarry than, than the club, I'd say. Mm -hmm. and, and, but anyway, yeah, I mean Newcastle had some great memories up there, you know, some 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 uh, you know sometimes I even YouTube myself because I think I, you know I mean because I must have made a save at some point in my career because <laughs> you know, every time I watch Sky Sports and I was Ronaldo's just come back to the Premier League and they just show goals scoring past me and <laughs> I don't know whoever else whoever yeah. else has broke a record uh, I don't know Rooney when he scores that vo volley <laughs> against me at, that was at some Old Trafford strike, that. and I keep saying to people like yeah. I'm sure I made a save once mm. like but I have to Google it myself to, yeah. to actually admit it because obviously people just want to show goals mm. and stuff and, and see me hooking the ball of the net you know but. Yeah, it's some great times in Newcastle, great memories, of course, and um, yeah, made one or two saves as well, yeah. Yeah, the Newcastle fans are solid as well. It's a shame that they've not had yeah, still, much silverware because um, they're in a bit of turmoil they're now in Newcastle. Yeah. Like they're really struggling. The mm. Good chance they'll get relegated this season. That massive club, phenomenal club. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they will get relegated. I think they'll have enough to, to be safe, but at the same time, the Newcastle fans want to be challenging for the Premier League. And I know that sound, might sound a bit, because mm. you're talking about relegation, but at the same time, the ambitions of the club and 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 they, they should be up challenging. Uh, had they got the right follow or the right backing, sorry, financially, then they would be up challenging because you know that stadium and that you know it's a special place to play football. It's in the heart of the city. You know you walk across in the pubs and the clubs and the lads are you know walking from the pub straight into St James's Park and you know it's a special place to play football. Who was it signing for Man City for six million? Because that was a big price tag for any goalkeeper. Mm. It was that 10, 11 years ago? That over ten years ago that. How was that, and especially being from a club you spent twelve years with, mm. to then basically having another debut for a yeah. another club? Was that a weird feeling? He's still <laughs> yeah, nervous, still yeah, there. Yeah, I was still nervous. Actually, funny to <clears throat> mention Ronaldo, there, but he, last week he said he was nervous making his debut for Man United. Yeah, there that. last week it was, it was like it took me back to like when I was thirty three, made my debut for Man City. You know, it's you think you have played all them hundreds of games, you wouldn't be nervous, like you know. But again, you're going to a new club. Um, there's a new set of supporters. Yeah, they would have seen you obviously clips of you from playing at Newcastle, but now they're they're seeing every minute of you, like you know everything you do. They're watching you, and yeah, it was it was. I remember it was a Saturday. It was an early kickoff. We were live on Sky TV, and um, I suppose the eyes were on me because I was in, that was the newest signing. Um, and lucky for me, not lucky for me, but that day I had a great game. Got man of the match, and you know straight away you're off to to a good start. You know as much with the new fans as anyone because you want to mm -hmm. you want to impress them. Yeah. Yeah, how was it when Mancini came in? Because I know he didn't see eye to eye. Mm. Yeah, it was a strange one. Um, I don't, I still don't know to this day what I done wrong, but um, I think at the end of the day, he 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 was a person, and how he managed was 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 
on the age, but he, he fell out with everyone, like, you know, and, and, and be that, not just players, it was like medical team, the chefs, the bus driver. I don't know, it, it was just a strange, it was a strange way to manage. If you ask me, we talk about Bobby Robson in the past, how brilliant he was with people. You know, man management skills was phenomenal and, and I would say Mancini was, was probably the opposite to that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's his style of management or whatever, but even after I had left, you know, a couple of years after, you know, he was semi-forced out because the players, everyone fell out with him, you know. It was just, a, you know, that the time I'd done, I just get him his shoulder, I think, with three or four games to go in the season. And Joe Hart was on loan and that summer he brought Joe back. Um, and I was fit to start the season, but I didn't get a look in. Literally, League Cup games, FA Cup games, normally play the second choice keeper in the mm -hmm. early rounds, you know. I think he played Oxford or something and didn't didn't play me. I was like, what's what's going on here? And it was just he just wanted me out, you know. I don't know if he was thinking I was a big personality in the changing room or negative in the changing room. I, I don't think I've ever been negative anywhere I've been, you know. But you know, people get things in their head, and and that was that was the end of the road really for me mm -hmm. at Man City. You know, I was and again going back to I could have sat there and got two or three years left in my contract, whatever it was, and and took the money. But going back to when I left home, I wanted to go play many games as I could. And took a massive wage cut to go to Villa and, and to get playing again. I wanted to show the people I'd still plenty to offer and, and that was that was key for me. I didn't want to finish my days on the bench. Yeah. You know, at, at Man City. Mm -hmm, because he's flying at Italy just now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people say watch this and go, oh, he's a brilliant manager because he's just yeah, won the yeah, Euros yeah. for Italy, you know, and that's <clears> right. So I can only I can only give you my personal mm -hmm. what what happened with me at at, at, at Manchester and, and I think a lot of other players I speak to as well. It was it was similar. Like they fell out with everyone at the end, you know, and do you think that's that Italian nature though? Maybe yeah. a bit arrogant? Like, yeah, I don't really that. understand it. Because if you think about it, we're all working for the same cause. You're working for yeah. the same badge and you're working for the same people. You know, you'd think you'd want, yeah, and you're not going to have a follow with a few people along the way, mm -hmm. but not, you know, the, people, the amount of people you did. But yeah, it could be an Italian thing in the blood or whatever and all that kind of stuff, you know. But I've worked with some great Italian people, like Trapattonian people, like that, and Marco Tardelli, you know, with yeah. Ireland and stuff, and they were great guys, you know. So I suppose every everyone's different. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's life, isn't it? He was seeing me setting fires instead of putting them out. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's mad, isn't it? I know. Crazy bastard! You came across <laughs> some crazy fuckers in your your playing career. Yeah. How was it coming near to the end of your career? Because play goalkeepers can now play into that late thirties, early forties now yeah. with the nutrition and kind of yeah, yeah. things can play. But when you're, the career that you've had and how was it like when you're starting to come to the end of, like coming to international retirement as well? Because you retired and then came back. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was actually Roy got me back playing. Roy was a coach at Villa at the time, mm -hmm. and he was assistant coach with Martin O'Neill at, at, at Ireland as well. And you know, I'd retired, and he would watch him every day in training. He goes, "You know, I think he can still do stuff for us for Ireland." And I would like, like to come back and blah blah blah. You know, so I did miss it when I did sort of walk away from it. You know, because um, you kind of think, "Oh, this I spend time with the family now." and focus on my club football and I'll be able to play longer if I do that, you know, but I played for Ireland for 20 years. Like, so when you, when you walk away from it, you, you, you're going to miss sort of meeting up with the lads and it's, it's all you've ever known, isn't it? And playing for Ireland yeah. and having the crack and you just, you're going to miss that. And that's, that's normal, you know? So Roy asked me to come back and, and obviously met up with Martin and Leland and went, went back for, for a couple of years. And, um, but at the, towards the end, obviously it was more a sort of understudy with Darren Randolph was, was first choice towards the end, you know? Mm -hmm. And, I didn't mind that we went to the Euros and stuff and it was sort of, it was different for me because it was more a, a supporting act than, than previously I was obviously the number one. Yeah, because you're the longest serving Irish player then over mm. 20 years. Yeah. That must be a good feeling though from a kid from Don Donegal yeah. to then showing what can be done for Yeah, definitely, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I suppose that's probably due because you're a goalkeeper as well. Mm -hmm. The longevity and stuff that a goalkeeper can have. But yeah, I mean, as I said, you go back to make my debut at 19, you know, that could have been the one and only cap, you know, so to, to yeah. turn that into 20 years of, of playing, that was that was very special. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And Robbie Keane's number one, most caps, yeah. your second. Yeah. Are you gutted that you never beat him? Um, no, I got it. I think <clears throat> probably if I hadn't retired, I probably would have been maybe Up level off them or whatever, yeah. you know, but, you know, again, I, I think you look at the, you sort of go through your career and you look at older people, what what they think. I was kind of looking at Brad Friedel at the time, people that got older, a few, few years older than me, and I think, mm -hmm. well, he retired from America, whatever, because it prolonged his Premier League career. And obviously, I wanted to play as long as I could in the Premier League as well. So you, you try and take on board from other, what other people do as well to try and. But looking back, when I did sort of step away the first time, I didn't really miss it, if I'm being honest. And uh, I wanted to go back, yeah. Yeah. What's your proudest moment in an Irish jersey? Um, well, obviously, walking out. You know, in that first game for the World Cup was 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 special. I probably going back to the Iran game as well. When when the realization that we've actually qualified mm -hmm. because 
as you said, it was a it was a big gap from from the previous regime. You know, the previous guys, the Jack Charlton era, to not qualify then for whatever it was ten eight eight or ten years, whatever it was. So it was like um, that sort of pressure was building as well with the media and with the fans back at home. Like we haven't qualified again, so that that mm -hmm. pressure was building. So we got there in O two, and that was like. Yeah, that was ledge, like walking out in that first game. Yeah, we had the sort of fiasco in Saipan and stuff, but that was all behind us. Now we wanted to go out there and, you know, when you stand up and the national anthem's going and, you know, you know yeah. the whole, you know, the whole country's at a standstill back in Ireland because I've been there as a fan mm -hmm. and you're just, you know, the hair's <coughs> in the back of your neck standing up when you hear that national anthem and there's no there's no better feeling than that. How was it in two thousand? Was it two thousand nine with Henri in the handball? Mm. How was that then? There's a blatant handball. That yeah, you were going off your nut. You yeah. thought you were going to get sent off. Uh, no, you were going to the ref. Like, how was that then? Playing such a good game, tight game, mm. extra time. Then he handballs it twice and puts it in the net. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was just mad. That was <clears> a, it. Was just a mad time. We actually played the first game. We lost one 0 in Dublin. Yeah, and we, we. I don't know if it was the nerves or we were just a bit cautious because it was a two legged thing, and we just. We felt after the game we, we, we were better than what we played, you know, and we didn't sort of show to everyone how good a team we actually were at the time. And we went to Paris and was like, right, we're taking the shackles off here. We, we've got nothing to lose, obviously. So it's the second leg of a playoff to get the World Cup finals. And we all think sort of huddled before the game, lads, this is it, lads. You know, shit or bust. If we can go to show to people we, we're good enough to be in the World Cup finals mm -hmm. again. So it was probably one of the... I know we, we lost it on... on, on on that controversial goal, but it's probably one of the best performances in an iron shot from the whole team. You know, we were really at it and and, and we just felt so, I don't know what the word is, cheat is probably strong, but so, I don't know, I don't know what's the word, it's a loss or whatever after the game mm -hmm. to, to try and get our heads around what had happened, yeah. you know. <clears throat> um, it was such a blatant handball. You know, we've we've not got to a World Cup finals and we sort of the last 18 months, it's a long road to get to that stage, you know home and away and you know traveling around Europe to try and qualify for the World mm -hmm. Cup finals and it comes down to that one incident and they're going and we're not you know so it's it's you'd rather Henri done one of his amazing goals and whipped yeah. them to the top corner and you go okay we've got bait to mm -hmm. a bit of brilliance from, from Henri not not the way it turned out did you hold any grudges when they played against them after that hmm. no not really I always, you know I've always said <clears throat> It, 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 yeah, did it's, they ever speak to you after that? I've done a, co a couple of things in London. I think it was was it for Cadbury's or something, and he was mm -hmm. part of the we were ambassadors or something. At did the they time. ever say anything? He, he kind of there was like an elephant in the I room. Was and an elephant behind your shoulder. <laughs> there was a big elephant <laughs> in the room, but he never really he never really brought it up or, did they not? or spoke about it. No, I don't. I don't think you know. I don't think he's overly proud of the fact of what happened. You know, yeah. and, and no, he's a brilliant player, Henri. Little you know? class and. Um, but to be fair, and his sort of defence a little bit was was you know that was so blatant. He sort of sort of done his forearm and then pulled it on his left. And it was like a double handball. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remembered, like, but I was right there, obviously, and I was like, I'm just getting the ball to take a free kick because it was it was so blatant. And I've turned in the refs run point to the centre circle and and the lines was running up as if it's a goal. Like, and I'm like, what? That's that's just happened, you know. And it's probably the quickest I've ever moved on a football pitch. <laughs> I was spreading that <laughs> to the referee, but. Yeah, I just could not believe it. Like, mm -hmm. and then I was always a hoo ha after. Like, should be replayed, and you know, it was obviously big news in France and Ireland, but it was actually massive news around the world. That the whole mm -hmm. everyone was talking about it. it was such a yeah, you know, I don't know, an injustice we felt as an injustice. Mm -hmm. That's the, probably the word that we felt after the game that you know that can't be right. They can't be going to the finals because of because of that. You know, and they did. Mm -hmm. How was that coming back then when you're trying to play it again? Does that affect you more than like getting put out with Spain? Mm. And there, what 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 game is you've been at your doubt most, your lowest? What game has really set the bar where you thought, "Fuck me, like I can't be asked with football anymore." Mm. Was there any games that set like that must floor you? Mm. Like yeah, the that, whole that nation day, behind yeah, you. That and was then, tough. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, probably more from a sort of sporting thing and a psychology point of view was was probably when I was I think it was twenty three years ago. I played at, for Newcastle at Blackburn away, and I dropped the cross and. Um, they scored from it, like, or no, they shot and Nico Stavis in the line, handballed it, sent off 10 men with like 80 minutes to play away at Blackburn. We lost 5 0 or something. I think it was a fall for an or goal or something as well. My head was mangled, like, you know, and probably any young goalkeepers that would watch it, maybe, you know, it was my worst critic was me. I was the I was the worst on myself more than anyone, more than any reporter or my dad or, or any manager or coach. I was the hardest on me, and that's not a good thing, especially when you're in. The position, a specialized position as a goalkeeper, so it's not a good place to be, you know. So I seeked a bit of help after that game, you know. I went and spoke to the physio, 
Derek Wright at Newcastle is still there actually and, and he you know on the QT because then it was seen maybe seen as a weakness back then that well, he's going to see a psychologist he's going to get help you know is he alright like type thing because mm. it was a wee bit you know it was a wee bit I don't know maybe a little bit old fashioned at the time that you know you everyone should be mentally strong everyone should be yeah. do you know what I mean so I, I felt that not not a weakness I actually felt as a strength for me to go and go and, and get some help and I, and I felt that if that can help me five ten percent, then then why wouldn't I do that? You know, yeah. uh, not as a weakness. Actually, I thought it was more of a strength to go and speak mm-hmm. to someone. You know, and and I spoke to a sports psychologist, Richard Mullen, his name was in, in Cardiff, and you know, we built up a relationship for the probably the remainder of my career. Really, you know, ways and methods of dealing with mistakes, mistake management, and mm-hmm. and obviously how to deal with that in in game situation. You know, and and that's going a bit deep from a sports point of view, but it was more just you know I felt I had tools and to deal with it. You know, in 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 years to come, then. Mm-hmm. But I think that shows you your character. That to uh, then, when we were talking about the nineties, is a tough place. It's like when you're growing up as a kid back in the day. It was big boys don't cry. It yeah, was like yeah. that's why suicide rates so high in men because we bottle up our feelings and emotions. Mm-hmm. We suppress them, and then it mm-hmm. comes to our head, and we can't handle them no, anymore. That like, no. men are sen- more sensitive than women. It's yeah. like we've been brought up in that era where it's you don't cry, like toughen up, like man up like mm-hmm. that's the wrong thing to do and if mm-hmm. you for a young kid to doing that and granny asking for help take some amount of courage and that goes for anybody watching like mm-hmm. take some amount of bottle because i know you lost one of your good friends um gary speed mm-hmm. and who was a massive player for newcastle and then that was kind of out the blue in mm-hmm. so 2011 yeah were you at were aston villa then yeah just yeah yeah we were aston villa <clears throat> we I remember we were playing swansea away and Zal Shearer called me actually. It was, we we're just about to go down for for the team meeting, you know, before yeah. we left the hotel to go and play Swansea. And he's obviously made the phone call. He phoned me. I was like, you know, "Is he ringing me on match day? Like, you wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't normally ring a player on a match day. Like, you know, he just wouldn't." And um, obviously, he told me the news about Speedo. And I was like, "You, sh- you should be checked. Are you sure? Blah blah blah." You know? I was, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's it's real. Like, it's it's not nonsense. Like, you know. And I just. I couldn't believe it because I think a couple of weeks before I met him actually in Manchester and and just in the shop and, and uh, just one of the shops in town I just I hadn't seen him for a while I was still keeping touching the phone you know but he was busy with managing wheels and I was busy playing and we still we we're still good friends over the phone but not actually seen him and just weird like a couple of weeks later then he was he was gone you know um, just weird and we with the game was we talk about the game getting called off because he was the Wales manager we we're in Swansea in Wales obviously and we thought oh that's probably the right thing to do you know but. But the powers of B goes now. The game goes ahead, you know. And I was like, I have to get my head around this now, you know, and, and yeah. sort of prepare for that. Um, and then I just sort of sent. I don't know if you remember, but the, the minute of silence before the game, like the I tears. just broke down, like I just couldn't keep it together, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I just, I just didn't seem real, really, you know. Um, but then I always think, what would Speedo would have wanted? What what would he have wanted me to do? And he would have wanted me to play and keep a clean sheet, which I did, and. And semi do it for him, you know. Albeit maybe the game shouldn't have been played, but you know he was he was a really strong willed character and and just just a bit in shock as much as anything that that that's that's like happened. Even now, you still you know still can't believe I still stay in touch with Tommy and Eddie's two sons and that and you know that's you know they're, they're growing up now living in America. They're they're you know great lads and you know he's missing out and all that you know and Gary's a great dad you know and it's just you know as you said about the no one really knows what's going on, and you know, in people's lives or in people's heads, I suppose. And and, and it's mm-hmm. good to talk, and and you know, wishing now that a couple of weeks before before he did die, that I would have you know asked him, "Are you ever, everything all right? Do you want to talk about anything?" You know, you just, but he seemed just the normal speedo that he always was, like joking and having a crack and having a laugh and stuff. You know, he didn't seem as if anything was up. You know, um, yeah. and the people, some of the people say that's the the, the the people he least expected, and that's what happens. You know, mm-hmm. and it's. I suppose speaking about this now, then you know, if you say if someone seeks out help, then that's this interview today's worth it, isn't it? You know, that that someone maybe in a similar situation, that there is people out there that you can help you. Um and I just wish Speedo had reached out to someone. That's that's all really. Yeah, so you tend to see it's the one with the biggest smiles who are the one who are the most broken. Mm. So people don't see through their pain, their misery, mm-hmm. their heart. Yeah. That's why a lot of people then turn to then drink drugs, whatever it is, to fulfill that loneliness or void mm-hmm. where they portray themselves that they're fine, the happiness, the funny men. That's pro- you tend to, again. It's probably the funny people mm. who <clears throat> they just want to portray themselves as being okay. Because like you as a young kid, does that then make you think about that time you went to see a psychologist at 23, 24 that you can potentially go down that route fast and not expect it to then seeing someone who then did 
go down that route mm. and instead of just reaching out for help because as men we're too proud to ask for help we're mm. too proud to say that we're struggling we're too proud to just be who we can be like it's because we're all going through this journey where sometimes we just don't know what the fuck is going on mm. and like you say there that like, sometimes it's the ones who think they've got it all together that are the ones who are struggling the most sometimes it's just asking that simple question are you okay mm. does that play a lot in your mind that because there's no telltale signs anyway but sometimes because mm. I've lost friends to suicide and sometimes my mind thinking was the signs there why didn't I just ask are you okay today but mm -hmm. you're too blinded by sometimes their presence because you actually think they're okay but yeah, then yeah. as you get older you start to realise these the telltale signs there's always telltale signs if you really mm. look yeah. close enough like when you seen them there there was a river do you look back and think fuck man I wish I'd have just said like, are you okay mm -hmm. But then again, I don't know if Smeeda would have said anything because he's exactly. been guarded. Yeah, he probably yeah. wouldn't have said nothing. Mm -hmm. He would have said, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's great. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because he, he probably was too proud to say, well, do you know what? I think I'm struggling a bit here because of, cause of the X, Y, and Z. Obviously, yeah. I don't know what mm -hmm. was going on in his head, you know. But I think, as you say, that's that's the key. Like, you know, people on the from the outside, they look, you know, they, they are okay. But maybe, you know, the problem, I think, in this this current life and this current journey we're all on is, is uh, I'm not going too deep in here, but it's like, you know, you're you're sort of sidetracked by your own sort of life. You know, your own kids and your own family. Mm -hmm. You just got a dog two days ago, and then it's like, you know, the hectic of school runs. The school's back on, and you're you're everyone's life's really busy. You know, but yeah. if you actually sit down and slow it all down and and ask them simple questions like, you know, because people do need help at times, and it's not, as I say, not a sign of weakness. I didn't I didn't do I done I done it from a sporting point of view. If I'm being honest, at the time, because I knew this is not right. That this can't be right from a sporting point of view. But even just in life in general, if 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 you do need help, there are there are plenty of good people out there who who can help you. And and I don't think it's a weakness to seek help. I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's a strength that oh, yeah. to make you a better mm -hmm. person or a better dad or a better friend or a better mm -hmm. brother, whatever it is. Then yeah. why not? Why not ask for help? Yeah, I'm an ambassador for a uh, wonderful place called Chrissy's House, which mm -hmm. is. Um, Women and Rowan lost her son and she's been doing this the last 10 years. It's a 24 seven suicide center where people can call up mm -hmm. anonymous and mm -hmm. not just for people who are suicidal, for people who've lost people to suicide because mm -hmm. I've said this many times, but with suicide, you're not really taking away your pain. What you do is really pass it on to the people who are close to you because then you think, shit, was it me? Could I have done more than people, other people kind of blame yeah. themselves. But yeah. I've never, I've had thoughts sometimes when I used to drink and take drugs and shit, I used to think, well, would people miss me? Mm. I never had the bottle to yeah, actually yeah. go and do it. So you don't know actually people's struggles, how hard it is to then go and leave kids and family behind and put mm -hmm. that pressure on them. Like, mm -hmm. To do that, like, it takes some amount of bottle yeah. as well. Like, same as footballers now, like, <clears throat> there's a lot of pressure now with social media because then back in the day it was only newspapers. Mm. So now everybody's got an opinion. So mm -hmm. if you have a bad game and people are flooding your fucking social mm. media, then yeah. that must be so difficult. Do you think there's enough things in place for professionals to then seek help? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Actually, it's a good question. Um, I would say probably not. Um, I know the PFA do work, but uh, again, you have to sort of reach out to them. I mean, I've been retired four or five years. I've not spoke to anyone from the PFA. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I, I think there should be something in place when you retire, then, you know, go and have a chat with someone from the PFA or have some sort of, not take long to sit down and go through, well, what's, what's next now for, for Shea, given what is he, what do you see the future? And, yeah. you know, we could help you with this or we could help you with that. I've not spoke to anyone from the PFA. I'm not having to go to the PFA, but that's, mm -hmm. I'm just telling you how it is. Like, and you mentioned that I, I played in the Premier League for, for a long number of years. Like you'd think there'd be some sort of a support network around mm. you for that, you know, which could be better. Um, Premier League players, we talk about social media. I think it's, I was sort of lucky the last couple of years, then it was only coming into it really. So, you know, I think the problem that young players have now is, is, is they come into the change room after the game and they're on their phones and like they're worried about some guy, don't know, in the middle of nowhere who's never kicked a football in their life. What, do you know what I mean? You can yeah. have 99 amazing <coughs> comments and then one negative and it's like, phew, do you know, is he right there by saying that I should have scored or should have saved that shot or, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I don't know. If I was a player now in the modern day game, then I would switch off sort of notifications type thing and just, yeah, you can have your Instagram and your yeah. and your, and your Twitter or whatever and, and say some stuff, you know, but uh, you'd have to, for me personally, you'd have to switch yourself off from mm -hmm. all the, the negativity, like, you know, because... There is a lot of abuse online, you know, be it whatever. Like it's just can be too much for people and players, and and people I think forget as well that you know, yeah, he's a brilliant player and he's on X amount a week and he's got the nice car, nice whatever it is. Like, 
Well, he's a human being at the end of the day. He's got mm -hmm. the same thoughts as you have. He's got the... Hopefully you know, the same. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like, because some of them are superstars. They think, oh, well, he, you know, he's not got feelings or he, you know, he'll be all right. He, do you know what I mean? It's just, it's not a nice way to be when you sit behind yeah. a, a phone or a keyboard mm -hmm. and you, you start hammering some person you've, you've never met before. You don't, you probably don't know him. You just know him from reading a newspaper or yeah. did he score last week or not? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a good place to be. Because we're all under the same sky. We all bleed the same, we all bleed the same man. air. Like, because people see you playing in a premiership and, living a great life and surrounded by great people that they don't see, they'll see you as immune to problems and pain. But if anything, the more success becomes the more demons, the more problems, the mm. more temptations. Like mm. It's hard to then balance everything. There's some players you'll see going down a drink. Like I'm, I speak to Paul Gascoigne a lot. I'm good friends with his agent mm -hmm. and that. And you see the route he went down, George the best. Like yeah. Snooker players I had Jimmy White on a couple of weeks ago and he was the same, drink drugs and mm -hmm. friends with Higgins and who would end up bang on the drink and mm. that's why a lot of boxers as well when they retire because they miss that a big void, buzz there's something emptiness it's like you give your whole yeah. life to something but then it's a case of okay cut and closes we've used you now yeah. do your thing like, yeah. and then they come back and fight in their 40s Evander Holyfield should not be fighting he was fighting last nah, week and I I it was just embarrassing like, they shouldn't they should be protecting these people the people who gave you so much yeah. to watch and entertainment over the years because yeah. all it is is entertainment yeah, yeah. you're just it's a big circus mm -hmm. <laughs> that's all that's it is saying, but there should be more <clears throat> done for players who leave because yeah you do not use because you've had a lovely life and a lovely career and blah blah and you should be you know if you've looked after yourself then you should be okay yeah but at the same time you still have them as you say like for, for whatever 25 years i've been told to be there at that time do this do that eat this do that do, you know what i mean mm -hmm. literally for my whole my best part of my life and then yeah. next day it's just over. It's just stops. Like no mm -hmm. one's telling you anything. You haven't to be anywhere. Do you know what I mean? So I do think there should be better things put in place. It, it just it's just even a support thing, you know, just to say, well, are you okay? And can we help you or support you in your next sort of journey? Because most players finish 35, 40. Like, you know, they're still the whole, most of their lives ahead of them, you know, yeah. at the end of their career. Definitely. It's a short lived career as well. Mm. How was it retiring? Yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky. I played the forty-one, and, and yeah, the last few years it was more sort of a backup sort of thing and support support goalkeeper really. But um, you know, I knew it was, the time was coming. I had issues with my right knee, to be honest, um, gave me a lot of jip. So I had a few operations and that. So it was just my body probably telling me that you know enough's enough now mm -hmm. at this stage, you know. But um, yeah, you miss the you miss the buzz and the excitement of of, of playing and out in front of thousands of people and. You know, it's just a special feeling. You can never re, you never get that back, can you? So it's it's, but at the same time, you know it's going to come to an end. You you know that's that's life. Time waits for nobody. You know, so yeah. you just have to get your head around it and, and move on to to other things, I suppose. And as I say, that for me, I done the media for a bit, and then was at Derby, and now I'm I'm a little bit of a crossroads. Now, what do I do next? Do I go back and you know maybe a coaching management slash role, or do I do some media stuff and 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 just have more time with my family and and play a bit more golf and enjoy life a bit more because I think people forget as well when you're a coach or a manager you know you're you've you're working seven days a week like and you're there in the last three years the half six was leaving here in the morning and home at half six at night you know the kids from bed an hour mm -hmm. later you know so it's not great for for family life yeah you get if you do well you get good rewards like you know but at the same time it's just getting a bath I think life is about getting balanced right and that's both sort of on the pitch and off the pitch and you know, maybe balance for me might be might be a little bit more demanded to the media thing. But if some opportunity came up, then yeah. it'd be too good to turn down. I think, well, I'll give it a go. Like you know, <laughs> but it's, is that just yeah. is that stupid or is that mm -hmm. just the 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 drug of football? You just love, you know, because you talk about do you miss football? The nearest you're going to get to then is be part of a coaching team and and still have the ups and downs of winning mm -hmm. and losing and and whatever you know. So that's the thing the media doesn't give you. It doesn't give you that buzz or excitement of the match day yeah. experience and, you know, the fans or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So you'd always miss that, you know. Yeah. It's the smell of the grass. It's the changing room. It's, <laughs> a, it's a something like that. Yeah. I've got a boxing match in two weeks, but I played a charity football match on Friday night, but my coach, the boxing coach was saying, look, you can't play this fucking game because yeah. if you get injured, yeah, I'm like, nah, I wasn't doing right, all yeah, that. Yeah. I snuck out and uh, some dude post, uh, tagged me in a photo that he was... Um, he follows and he's seen me right. straight on Raging the phone. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. I don't know. But it's just, it's in your blood. <clears throat> yeah. Because when I stop, my thoughts then 
become vicious. Mm. They become crazy. When I'm on a good path, it's because I'm working hard, it's because I've set goals. So when mm -hmm. you kind of stop, it's okay going your golfing and that and yeah. family time, but there's still something that's not quite yeah. complete. There's something quite missing. That's your whole life to be out yeah. in the garden with two jumpers as goalposts, to be mm. out in the fields, and mm. that's living. Mm. Like, but then it's a stress. I've never been a manager or a coach, but I'd imagine with more pressure and stress doing that than actually playing in goal. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's for you. Like, it's good to take a wee break, recharge, and then yeah. something else will pop up. and You do that because you were you not in the soccer aid game yeah, there. I played in that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. How was that experience? Yeah. As you saying Bolt in that play? Yeah, I just thought I'd knock it over the top and he can get on the <laughs> end of it. Like, but uh, I think he got cramped just before <laughs> half time. Him and Mo Farah got cramped, yeah. which is which is funny, but. Um, no, I mean it was it was obviously we raised over thirteen million. Unbelievable, it was unbelievable, you know, for for mm -hmm. UNICEF. So, but no, it was nice to meet lots of different people from different backgrounds. There was actors, obviously, who a fellow both. Scotsman, Compton. Yeah, he played there. well actually. Yeah, yeah he's a good player. Good I used player, to play yeah. back in the day. Like Celtic fan as well. Yeah, I mean. yeah, mad time. So, uh, no, it was good to meet him. But all these different people you meet that you mm -hmm. wouldn't normally meet, obviously, you know, and they're in the same team. And then obviously we won the game, so we had a bit of a sing song in the bus now mm -hmm. back to the hotel. It was like just like, yeah. but like old times, you know, but all these different different people and. I'd say it was nice to nice to obviously to raise that money, but mm -hmm. also just to, good to meet some new people and and they're all on different journeys as well. Some young guys, you know, what's he called again now? I bloody hell, I forgot his name now. Young young blood. Don't know if you've come across him mm -hmm. yet, but he's he's ripping it up and people like you know chunks and yeah, chunks you, YouTuber, YouTuber, yeah, yeah, yeah he's a funny and, bastard. Yeah, so there's like all these different people like yeah. you know and um, Ollie Muzz, Matt Wright. Yeah. yeah, like you saying, Bolt's a mega yeah, star. He's like, a legend. He's a legend. His man, man. his agent actually is from Donegal, would you believe? No way. No, no it's crazy. You like, get everywhere, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, at the, he was at the game as well. So mm -hmm. I was just chatting to him about back home and stuff. And he used to be an athlete, actually. So I was like, how did you get. Mm -hmm. Which is always, when I finished running, I set up this agency and he's got 50 mm -hmm. athletes now or something. But yeah. his main one's who's saying Bolt, which is he goes everywhere with him, you know. So. Shit, man. Yeah, that's that's unbelievable. Does that not make you want to play again? When you have yeah, that re experience, it does, it does. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, the standard, you know, wasn't <clears throat> high, obviously, because you've got people who are actors and whatever mm -hmm. else and, and rappers and all this kind of yeah. stuff, you know. But it was still, you still get the feeling of playing. And it was the Etihad was full, which was brilliant, you know. And um, you do, but you know yourself, it's never going to happen. You know that that ship has sailed. Mm -hmm. um, it's just what, what, what comes along next. That's the next question. Yeah. Who was it with Frank? Was it Frank Lab part that took you to Derby? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how was that experience then, retiring and then getting into coaching? Yeah, well, I was doing the media for about 18 months, I think, and then just out of the blue, Frank called me, and and um, I was like, it's, you know, it's a big opportunity. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he could have called anybody, really. So I didn't know Frank. I played against him a few times, but I didn't know him. I thought, oh, this is a chance to be part of his team. I want to be part of the team. And then I says, one day we could end up with Chelsea, maybe, because he's obviously a Chelsea legend. And a year later, he was at Chelsea, and I didn't go with him. So mm -hmm. that was a tough one. But... Um, no, again, it was a good experience. I mean, the last three years, it was obviously Frank the first year, then Philip Cocky, the Dutch manager, the mm -hmm. second year, and obviously Wayne Rooney then, just, just gone now, you know. So all different characters, all different managers, all different ideas, you know. But from for me personally, it was a good learning curve from a coaching point of view, yeah. what, what you maybe wouldn't do, what you wouldn't do, all that kind of stuff, you know. But, um, yeah, I'm sure Frank will be back in management soon, I would say. Yeah, Wayne Rooney, legend. Like, phenomenal career as well, man. You top mm -hmm. goal scorer, England top goal scorer. Like, unbelievable yeah. career, like. Hopefully they do well with Derby. Just played a bit decent this year, but again they seem in a bit of turmoil yeah, as well. Yeah, financial like, problems off yeah. the pitch is really bad. Like you mm -hmm. know, so you feel for them, you feel for the fans especially, and you know it's it's a big club. You know the training ground and the stadium set for the Premier League, but mm -hmm. you know the finances is is looks like you're in the administration now. You know, so that's looking really bleak for the future. You know, and it's a yeah. real shame because it's a great club. Points deducted, probably mm -hmm. relegation, and that's tough, man. Because yeah. you've got a great wee squad as yeah. well, but. Playing in English Premiership, you've played against some of the greats, Ronaldo's, Rooney's, Henri's, Bearcamps, Lampard's, Gerrard's. Mm. Who's the best player you've ever seen? Um, I don't know, probably the debate, was, I think we spoke off air about Messi and Ronaldo, I think. Yeah. You know, I was lucky enough to play against <clears> them <throat> two guys, you know, but Premier League, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many great players. You say Bearcamp, Henri, I don't know. Van Nistelrooy, Scholes. Aye. I don't know. There's too many, aren't there? But then many. again, I was lucky to play with some, <clears throat> some great guys at, at, at Man City as well, like Patrick Vieira, what a great player, what a great lad as well. Is he a tough bastard? Is he as tough as yeah. I mean, you see? Yeah, when you, when you like dinner or whatever, gentleman likes a laugh. Mm -hmm. See when he crosses the white line, it's like something comes over him, like <laughs> he would two for his granny, like, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like he's just, yeah. he's got that side to him, mm -hmm. like, you know, that steel. Um, 
a great lad. Um, then I was looking off with David Silva, played with him at, at City, Tevez, Vincent Company, you know, all these quality, mm. like great Premier League players, you know. But I'd love to maybe sit down one day and do a Premier League 11 that I've played against or with, you know. But again, it's too many players to, to think yeah. of, you know. I've probably forgot loads as well. You talk about Shear before, Roy Keane. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, Robbie Keane would be in there. I mean, there's so so many great players in the in down through the years. Um, Premier League, yeah, it's, a, it's it's I think it's fantastic league. I mean, I've been lucky enough to play in it, like, but you can see why everyone wants to watch it. You know, other leagues maybe are a bit boring or a bit predictable, whereas the Premier League, you know, even this year, you look how exciting every game is. It's hmm. it's class. How good was it, Dan? Yeah, he was alright as well. Eh? Oh, was he? <laughs> it's easy. We used to call Kevin Kabam. We call Kevin. We call Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Zinedine Kilbam used to call Kevin, like, you know, but uh, no, I mean, he was, he was phenomenal. I was looking, I was actually online this morning, just something popped up, I think it was 80s football or 90s football, and it was, mm-hmm. how good was Zidane touching? There was about 15 clips of Zidane just pulling the ball out of the sky and yeah. flicking it back over the defender and uh-huh. not making him and all this kind of stuff, but he mm. was, he was a phenomenal player, yeah. I know you spoke about the Iran games, but what game in your mind is the game that you felt as if that was the game that, you're just more passionate about or changed your life or was it a game that steps out and you played an absolute blinder mm. like, is it one game in your well, mind probably the ran two playoff games mm. were were big both in my mind and in my mm. career and I had had a big safety make in Dublin as well because we were I think we were leading 2-0 and they broke away last five minutes and made a, probably one of the best saves for Ireland down to my left you know we won the game 2-0 but had that a win in mm-hmm. you know the way goal and then they, well, they won the they won the second game, you know, 1-0, they would have been through, like, you know what yeah. I mean? So I think both legs, I made three, a triple save, I think, in the second leg as well, which was all a bit hectic, but looking back now, like, it was, I think, you know, as I say, it's the pinnacle of my career to play in the World Cup finals, you know, but to, to come through them two games, you know, and actually really, in both games, have big moments, mm-hmm. then I think that was for me to say, you know I mean? I've, yeah, played a big part or, or at least... You know, thought it played a big part to, to get us to the finals again, World Cup finals again, and and, and get the Irish fans. We went to Japan and Korea. Thought, oh, it won't be many there because it's ten, twelve hour flight, whatever, across the world to get there. Mm-hmm. And honestly, God, he came out in the first game. There was Irish flags everywhere, mm-hmm. like you know. And and the funny thing, you hear the stories about people like remortgaging in their house and selling their cars and stuff. And that that's that's not you know, that's not pie in the sky. So people genuinely remortgage houses and stuff mm-hmm. and, and and selling up and and getting loans from the credit union and all this just to go and watch watch you play football yeah. like you know the fans are absolutely phenomenal Irish yeah. fans you know it must make you feel proud yeah. I know you and Wayne Rooney are good friends now do you ever talk because that's one of the best goals in the Premiership like, yeah. the one he got angry against Newcastle and then the ball just seemed to drop when he's yeah, put no. in the top bin did they ever mention that to you? yeah once or twice <laughs> <laughs> yeah we travelled and every day to be fair the last eight months to Derby I'm not, I'm not there anymore now but mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I say, anytime there's a record or anytime it, there's a clips from the Premier League, that goal normally pops up, like, you know, and obviously he's, I think he was arguing the referee. I wish he had to argue with the referee for a bit longer because yeah. he, he wouldn't have scored it, like, you know, but yeah, you mentioned Wayne, he's, a, he's been a f- phenomenal player of the Premier League, a great, one of the greats, um, mm. and he can do some, some great things with the ball, and that was yeah. a fantastic goal, yeah. Who's the best manager you've ever played under? Um, well, I like, obviously, Mick gave me my chance, Mick McCarthy at Ireland, of mm. course, and then... You talked before about Kenny Dalglish with the, you know, giving me an opportunity at Blackburn and then bringing me to Newcastle and giving me that jersey. Um, and then probably Bobby Robson was, was would be high up there as well again for for what he achieved, you know, before he came to Newcastle and even when he when he came, we were rock bottom in the Premier League and, um, you know, he transformed us and did Champions League football again, mm-hmm. you know. So, and not a massive budget either. You know, you look at some of the teams now and the budgets they're spending to get in Champions League football. We, we spent a bit, but not like crazy money, like, like the modern day teams to get in the Champions League, so Bobby Robson was 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 was, was a brilliant manager. Yeah. yeah. Just before we finish up, was there not talks you going back to Celtic, the Man City kind of Aston Villa period or mm. after Aston Villa? Was that yeah? Bullshit? There was different. No, <clears throat> probably when I wasn't playing at City or whatever, there might have been mm. there might have been uh, some chat, but there was nothing really concrete to be honest. Yeah. Or not that I heard of or whatever or or, or whatever you know, but. Yeah, just going back to the sort of start of the coming, I would I would love to have played a couple of games for the first team, you know. Mm. Um, just because it's, it was my club growing up and, you know, a big Celtic fan, but still, it's always the result you look for at the weekend and stuff and, and try and get to the odd game if I can as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's it's just a shame, obviously, I know the Rangers fans will be laughing now, but like last year, they didn't get the 10 in a row because I think that's sort of a chance of a lifetime thing that they've missed now, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's 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 the rivalry up there, you know better than me, I'd say, is, is just... 
the whole city comes to a standstill on Dar- yeah, yeah, yeah. Derby Day, doesn't it? And the whole firm day. And it's 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 if you're a fan of football, then you have to take the box. You have to go to another firm game. But be, you don't have to be a, sp- a supporter of either of them, really, yeah. do you? But the sample that atmosphere is just f- unbelievable. It's next level. It's the best Derby, I believe, in mm. the, uh, on the planet. So I'm yeah. going to say that being from Glasgow, to say. Listen, I know everybody's trying to make love and peace and shit now, but it's the hatred that makes it. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the pure hatred. Like, I've not spoke to family members That's because why, of certain yeah. results for months at a time because yeah. it's a text message. It's the they annoy you, but yeah. like, I've tried to calm down with I've, as I've came away from football as I've got older, and you kind of it's only a sport. Yeah. But then when I watch it, the passion's still there, I and know. you think, "Fuck." That's like, why I don't agree with because the way fans <clears> are not allowed in there somewhere. Is that nah, they fucked it, man. That, that, that needs was, to change. That's that was part yeah, of, that's part was of, part of, the, of the fun, the, wasn't the, it? The game. That's part yeah. of the culture. That's yeah. but that's what makes it done as well. Yeah, hopefully to get back in the next year or two. But yeah. that's what makes the old firm what it is. Like it can be a bit boring now, but that's what makes it so mm. beautiful. That. Like, that is what it is. You're not a man who's made many mistakes in his life, not many bloopers, nothing like that. But the Dion Dublin one, when you've <laughs> you've made a good catch, everybody's kind of fucked off, and yeah. he's came round the back. He was off the park, but yeah. and then he's come on and scored. Like, how was that feeling? Because you you seem to every game you were a hundred percent, ten yeah. out of ten. Like, yeah, you seem to. Yeah, I mean that's life. It's part of football. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing looking back at that clip, like, because people ask me all the time, but it's is is um. It was just the start of the six second rule, and I think the rules have changed again. Can't go up with the rules; yeah. they change the laws of the football all the time. But the the, the law just came in. You've got six seconds to kick it, or you've got to drop it down. They played up the mm-hmm. pitch, you know. And at the start of any sort of law change, the referees are on it. So literally, like you know, now they it goes. Oh, he's kept the ball for fifteen seconds, not blue yeah. or whatever. But it was literally you see the ref going one, two, mm-hmm. three, like one of them. I go, Fuck, I'm going to kick this, and I'm looking up the pitch and sheer obviously not moving as per normal mm-hmm. so I'm going to think well, I gotta have to drop the, maybe drop this down yeah. like or whatever but I made the cardinal sin by not looking behind me mm-hmm. and I didn't even know Dan Dublin was challenging me it was, it was that high in the air catching that, that cross yeah. I didn't even know he was there but obviously I didn't kick it up the pitch I dropped the ball and Dean sneaked off the advertising board and, and sneaked behind me and scored like you know and I was just like oh my god is that really happening I just it was just it was one of the moments that sort of the world stopped it was kind of like did that, mm. is that has this happened <laughs> like, in your head it's yeah. kind of like it's happened. Didn't even mm. know where he came from. I didn't. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. And then obviously the joke after was it's the only Irishman not to know where Dublin is. So that's that was funny, like man. Scandalous. That's like, funny. You can laugh about it now. No, but but Kenny I, wasn't laughing at halftime. <laughs> Kenny Douglas yeah. gave me like this look at halftime. Mm-hmm. It was like, what the fuck yeah. are you doing, basically? You know, but yeah, I mean, again, I was a young keeper and yeah, we make mistakes, I suppose, mm-hmm. you know. And I never done that again. I mean, the rest of my, <laughs> whatever, 15, 20 years yeah. of football. But a few keepers did after that. You'd think you would learn even yeah. from my mistake, you know. But a couple of other guys done that uh, after me, so. You've worked under a few Scottish managers, though. You had um, Sunnis, Dalglish, Moyes, Lambert. Didn't have Moyes. Do you not have Moyes? No. Did he not come to, um, or was he not Aston Villa? Did Moyes no. ever go no. to Aston Villa? Or, no? Who was it? Who was that? Scottish? McLeish. Yeah. I'm thinking McLeish. Yeah, yeah. Aye, McLeish. Yeah. Big McLeish done well as well. Yeah. So he did. Yeah, he signed me at Billy, yeah. Scottish yeah. managers pretty, do okay. Yeah. Shite in the field. But <laughs> all right, managing. Paul Lambert wouldn't yeah, say yeah. he won the European well, Cup. Bruce, yeah. Bruce Dortmund. Yeah, yeah. What a player. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no, uh, I mean, there's some great Scottish managers over the years, definitely, yeah. 100%. Yeah, Scotland seem to be doing a bit better, but I like the boy Gilmore. Yeah, he's a good player. He's a yeah. player, Very man. Player, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got the nucleus of a good team now at the minute. Yeah. You know, just, you just need a good striker. Yeah, obviously qualifying for, for the last term. It was yeah. brilliant for the country, wasn't it? Fucking first time in 20 years, mate. Do you know how hard that is? Yeah. You know what I mean? But David Marshall, he was at Derby and I was, yeah. I was buzzing for him when he uh-huh. saved the penalty to get them there, you know. Yeah. It was a big moment for him, so. you great big goalie. Yeah. Great big goalie. Yeah. What do you think back, looking back in your career, Shay? Mm. What do you think, man? What a, what a fucking career, man. Like, phenomenal. Yeah. Probably regrets. I'd have regrets that we didn't want any tr- like enough trophies. I won a mm-hmm. couple of like I don't know, every couple of Man City won the championship. When was that? Something yeah, but like England. majors, like in the Premier League. Yeah, I was involved with the Blackburn squad, but didn't play games and stuff. So that would be the biggest regret, you know, that I didn't want enough. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because you set out to win trophies, don't you? But at the same time, probably ninety five percent of people playing the Premier League don't win the Premier League. You know what I mean? There's only a a small group of players that that, that do that. You know, if you think yeah. of all the players who've played in the Premier League, you know, so. I just come back to you, like I, I feel that I've been lucky, like because I've been come from this Lifford, a small village in the northwest of Ireland, you know, and and to to travel around the world, play I think in the best league in the world in the Premier League, and play against some of the best players in the world. I mean that's that's pretty special. Um, and again, just you know, you you just think that football is. I know it sounds a bit 
cliche me, but a size five thing full with air has given me so much in my life, you know, mm -hmm. um, on and off <clears> the pitch and see, seen so much of the world, you know, it's just, it's just, I've been blessed really, yeah. A oh, phenomenal career, like, well, nearly one of the island's most capped players that like, played more Premiership games than more, like, how many players have played in the Premiership? You think mm -hmm. you're top 20 or 30 most mm -hmm. appearances, like, it's unbelievable career, like, yeah, yeah it's the trophy side of things is the icing on the cake but then you look at guys like Shearer you look at so many other world class yeah, players yeah. that never really won many trophies but to even play against some of these players and travel the world and mm. give your family so much hope like, and the Irish fans like that's what dreams are made of like yeah. for your mum as well like she would be fucking proud like I say the only thing when you do well like there's always a regret there that like, people not seeing you doing your first appearance or mm. walking out with Ireland jersey on like because all part of your mind is that like, you always think about the sad stuff sometimes mm. when you're walking. That's the other thing my mum missed yeah. out and everything. Yeah. You know? Mum yeah. never seen any of it, yeah. like, you know. So that's that's the thing that would sort of wrangle with me as well. That wonder what she would have thought. Like wonder mm. what she would have told me or or whatever. What you know? Because yeah. my dad obviously advised me all the way through. Like you know, but you know they wouldn't agree and everything. So I wonder what mm. advice she might have given me at certain stages of my career. You know, but I always used it as a strength that she'd be there looking down on me and supporting me and trying to make her proud, all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. so. I use that as well as a, as a as a positive tool to to you know get me through difficult situations you mm -hmm. know and but it just would have been nice to see you know what what she would have thought yeah. of it all you know that's 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 an other thing that I can never change and again going back to what we said about <clears throat> people and lives and stuff you know everyone's going through a different journey everyone's you know a lot of people maybe to the watch this didn't know that mm -hmm. I lost my mum when I was four you know that's that's really tough for people you know and tough for me and and just not knowing what she would have thought of 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 what 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 sort of my life sort of panned out, you know, that I would have loved for her to be here for that. Yeah, but again, you've you've done everything else for your brothers, your sisters, your dad. Yeah. Right? And who's the, Bernsey, the postman, who's yeah, the, who's Bernsey, he, is he yeah. your best pal? <laughs> yeah. It's still a bit of friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he, they said for about people keeping you, your feet on the ground when you go home, like, you yeah. know, it's probably one of the driest sense of humour ever, like, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, one, one time my brother, my brother's funny as well, my brother Lamy's, there's one time I flew back to uh, Donegal in a helicopter, like it was just random. Some 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 guy offered me this opportunity, and he goes, "Fucking, hell, look at him now. He left in the back of a tractor, and he's fucking turned up in a fucking helicopter, mm. like you know." Mm. But it was just like mad how far you know things change yeah. and stuff, you know. But yeah, Burns, he's he's the local postman, and he he would definitely take you down a peg or two if he if you got ahead of yourself. He's the one always on about my English accent, like. But yeah. I'm still, I'm still not hearing it myself. <laughs> Listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, thanks, great man. career, great guy. You've gave so much inspiration to people, not just from Newcastle, but your hometown. Like, even though you've done 12 years in Newcastle, but people from Donegal and the whole mm. of Ireland, like, they've massive support of you, and, and rightly so. Like, you're very well supported, very well liked, and for letting us come on today and tell your story, brother, I thoroughly enjoyed that, mate. Thank God you. God bless you, and look forward to seeing what you do for the future. Hopefully, yeah. Cheers, bro. Thanks, James.